Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to call to order this meeting of the Council of the Town of Oakville for its regular meeting, and I would like to invite everyone to stand and join Council in O Canada. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. You passed the audition. That was very well done. Um, Madam Clerk, do we have any regrets for this evening? Uh, yes, we have regrets from Councillor Robinson and Councillor Hutchins. All right. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest, Council? Madam Clerk, I see none. <coughs> Council, are there, is there a mover and a seconder for the minutes or corrections for the minutes? Moved by Councillor Duddick, seconded by Councillor Lischina. All in favor? Opposed, if any, all of the minutes have been moved and approved, Madam Clerk. Um, Council, uh, with your permission, I'm now going to, uh, as a public presentation, present my 10th annual State of the Town speech. And uh, I want to thank everybody who came for it. And, uh, and those of you who came for other things, I, I hope that uh, it'll have something for you as well. We're gathered here together as residents, staff, and members of the councils of our town and our region for the 10th annual State of the Town Address in this chamber on the traditional lands of the Mississaugas of the New Credit. We're honored by the attendance of so many community leaders, as well as by our regional chair, Gary Carr. Chair Carr, I want to thank you for your leadership of the four municipal partners of the region of Halton. Together, we're working to make our communities across Halton more livable and more sustainable. This is my 10th report to you on the state of our town. In it, you will see a portrait of a community achieving its goals. You'll also see a community on the threshold of a great opportunity to do more, to help everyone participate in our successes. Over the last 10 years, our community has embraced a vision to be the most livable town in Canada. This year, Oakville moved from sixth to third place, sixth to third best place to live in the country in Money Sense Magazine's ratings. The city of Ottawa was number one, the city of Burlington was number two, and the town of Oakville was number three. So if you'll permit me, we could say that we have achieved best town in the country. But however you count it, this is the best ranking we've ever had. And it's the third year in a row that we've been in the top 10. We were also named the best place in Ontario to raise children and the second best in all of Canada. We are Canada's safest community and Canada's healthiest community, and our economy is strong. As chair of the auto mayors, I'm optimistic about the future of major employers like Ford, who today employ 5,200 people in Oakville. Everywhere we look, we can see significant signs of our vision's success. That success requires a strong foundation of fiscal health and stability. You, the councils of our municipality, have created that strong and stable fiscal foundation. 10 years ago, Oakville residents were weary of unpredictable and often unsustainably high property tax increases. Total property tax increases could fluctuate from 2 to 6% a year with no warning. Now, we've shifted to predictable and predictably low 
total annual increases. For eight years running, we have set and met the goal of keeping total property tax increases at or below inflation. Residents will also be pleased, I hope, to hear that we're going to be able to meet that goal once again in the 2017 budget. I know many residents were happy this year to receive the news from the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation, MPAC, of how much their properties have risen in value over the past four years. Happy about the value, you may have worried about the impact on your property tax. You'll be relieved to know that your home's taxes aren't going up as fast as your home's value is. We reset our tax rate to avoid any windfall surge in tax revenue. All the same, we will retain and maintain our strong municipal financial position. Chair Carr places the highest importance on keeping our AAA credit rating. We've done that again this year, even while we've made important investments to improve livability. A AAA credit rating means you pay the lowest rate of interest when you borrow. We want to see our property taxes go toward ways to improve our livability and our sustainability. Three of the ways I want to highlight are one, providing better roads and infrastructure, two, keeping up with demand for community facilities, and three, protecting green space and growing our tree canopy. Let's look first at our road improvement and infrastructure work. The money allocated to road resurfacing 10 years ago was not enough to keep Oakville's roads in good condition or improving. Our roads and work staff, in response to Council's desire to improve our roads, developed a plan to expand the amount of road work we can do in a year. This year, we allocated very nearly double the funding of 10 years ago, and that funding will resurface 22 kilometers of Oakville roads this year. By the time our roads plan is finished, virtually all of our roads will be in good condition. Renewing and reinvigorating our downtown's infrastructure is another key priority. By 2019, when we do the work to replace the Lakeshore Road foundations, in the downtown, we'll have a complete vision and a construction mitigation plan that the community can have faith in. When the work's done in 2020, we'll have a downtown that's even more attractive than it was when we began. The second way that we are improving livability is our progress creating community centers in each of Oakville's seven wards. This year, we've begun work on transforming the Oakville Arena in Trafalgar Park into a South Central Community Center targeted at seniors and youth. We're about to begin the functional planning of the next community center on the old OTMH grounds on Reynolds Street. Every two years, for the next four years, we'll be opening a new community center. In 10 years or sooner, we'll add the Neyagawa Boulevard community center expansion to the 16-mile sports complex. Our town values our community facilities and our public assets. We were recently relieved to know that the province has decided to relax its pressure for consolidation of municipal hydro utilities. Our hydro is already the ninth largest in Ontario, and it's a tremendous asset for the town just the way it is. The third key to our livability and sustainability that I want to highlight is making our town a cleaner, greener place to live. High priorities for our councils are our parks, trails, ravines, waterfront, and tree canopy. Our green and natural assets make for happier, healthier residents, so we have to protect them. First, we created the Oakville Natural Heritage System of 2,300 acres of protected and natural lands, green space, all across North Oakville. Then, working with Chair Carr, we protected our Natural Heritage System by making it part of a larger natural heritage system protecting 50% of Halton and connecting it and embedding it in the Greenbelt. We also committed to expanding Oakville's urban forest canopy. It might be the best in the GTA today, but we set a goal to reach 40% canopy coverage by Oakville's 200th anniversary. To do that, we have a four-part plan. We're now beefing up our policy of saving trees on private land we're extending tree protection controls to developers' land. We're fighting the emerald ash tree borer. And of course, we're planting more trees. Our policies reflect the ideas of stewardship espoused by the indigenous peoples who first inhabited this land. 
Among those ideas is the belief that we should make decisions for seven generations, not just for today or tomorrow. This idea reinforces our determination to protect our environment and control growth to what fits. Ten years ago, we had local, regional, and provincial rules that unfairly favored developers. The local land use policies and our official plans were full of loopholes and contradictions that allowed developers to run roughshod over residents and communities and win at the OMB when we would oppose them. So we created the Livable Oakville and the, and the Sustainable Halton official plans. These two plans introduced protection of our green spaces and our stable established neighborhoods from unwanted intensification. Our plans now channel growth to six carefully selected growth nodes. We've gone from losing 75% of the time at the Ontario Municipal Board, the OMB, to winning 67% of the time. We're being challenged at the OMB now over how we will conduct the planning process that's required to consider the future of the Glen Abbey Golf Course. I'm confident of our success in that contest. Our plans also work to protect heritage. This was inspired by the work of six-term former mayor, Harry Barrett. His foundational work to protect and preserve our heritage is the work we built upon in our livable Oakville plan. As proud as we are of our town and regional official plans, we're now working to review, renew, and revise these plans to make them even more effective. We've also turned our attention to the need to improve the province's rules for development, and we've won several improvements there already. Now, the province is considering changes to their growth plan for the Golden Horseshoe and changes to the powers of the OMB. Our engagement with the province to get these changes will not let up in the coming months. <clears throat> Thanks to our MPPs and cabinet ministers, Kevin Flynn and Indira Nadu Harris, we're in the best position ever for success in getting the changes we need to create the future we want for our town. We have planning staff who get Oakville. They have worked with us as local and regional councils to maximize the quality of our advice to the province as it evaluates changes to its growth plan and to the OMB. There are good reasons to be optimistic that provincial policies will change to help us achieve a more livable Oakville. As we do, we'll continue to attract more newcomers to town. And the question newcomers ask me most is why we call ourselves a town. They point out that we're surrounded by some of the country's largest urban centers. We have 25 times the population of the place that calls itself the city of Dryden. We call ourselves a town because it reflects the warmth, the friendliness, and the welcoming nature that has always helped newcomers to fit in and find their footing here. Although we faced great challenges and had our share of shortcomings, Oakville's history is one where welcoming and diversity always wins out in the end. Over the years, Oakville has been a place of refuge and of hope for those seeking security, prosperity, and new horizons. That was the case starting nearly 200 years ago when Oakville was a destination for those fleeing on the Underground Railroad to escape slavery and oppression. The hope and opportunity Oakville offers has been shared with immigrant communities ever since. Today, Oakville's diversity serves as a tremendous source of our strength. We all benefit from our thriving South Asian, Sikh, Hindu, Muslim, and our Chinese, Hispanic, European, Black, and Indigenous communities. This year, residents of all backgrounds have come together to welcome over 50 families from Syria. Our diverse population and our welcoming neighborly communities are a key part of what sets Oakville apart. In many places, the term neighbor is little more than a geographic distinction. In Oakville, being a neighbor still means more. In Oakville, we feel good that kids know which door to knock on when they need help. We have a neighborly urge to volunteer more. Being neighborly pays us back in our community safety and well-being. All of us contribute what we can to the strength of our community, and Oakville's strengths are abundant. We have a unified vision of what we want our town to be. We have committed community leaders working side by side with us 
to control growth and protect their neighborhoods. <clears throat> we also have what I believe to be the best municipal staff in the country. As councils, we have many times leveraged the strengths of our community and our staff to everyone's benefit. All of this is what makes me so confident in our ability to do more. So with that in mind, let's look at the opportunity that we have to be an even more inclusive and caring community and to make sure that everyone can participate in and enjoy Oakville's livability. Oakville's poverty rate is two-thirds the provincial average. Oakville's assets as a community are well above the provincial average. Our finances are the healthiest in Ontario. We can do more. With a smaller poverty rate and greater capacity to deal with it, it makes sense that if Oakville can't solve its poverty, then nobody else could either. We've expanded and extended our low-income transit pass to support people whose means of getting around is challenged. We've strengthened property tax deferment opportunities to help low-income seniors, but we can do more. Oakville and Halton can be the first municipality with a comprehensive set of community safety and well-being plans to fundamentally change our approach to poverty and community well-being for everyone. In the year ahead, it's going to be my focus to engage and expand everyone's participation in the safety and well-being of our communities. Our municipality is blessed with volunteer organizations who all have much to contribute to this work. Think of the vital signs and solutions work by the Oakville Community Foundation. Think of the ambitious targets that the Oakville United Way sets and meets every year. Think of the Halton Community Investment Fund that has grown to be such a significant force for good under Halton Chair Gary Carr. Think of the leadership of people like June Cockwell, co-chair of the Halton Poverty Roundtable. Think of the many members of the Chamber of Commerce and other service clubs and our youth sports groups who all care about our community's safety and well-being. If we reach out to each other to create these community safety and well-being plans the same way we did when we created the Livable Oakville and Sustainable Halton plans, we will enjoy great success. For the past 10 years, I've said the secret to Oakville's success is that we're a city that calls itself a town and acts like a village. That will remain the secret to our success for years to come. It's a pleasure to work alongside residents, staff, and you, my fellow members of council, to move forward with our livable Oakville and sustainable Halton visions. The last 10 years have been a time of tremendous success. I look forward to 10 more years of our success working together to protect our future for many generations to come. Thank you very much for considering my remarks. Now, Council, we have a number of delegations tonight. And uh, before we do that, the clerk would be very grateful if we go to a mover and seconder re to receive my report. Councillor Lapworth and Councillor Knoll, all in favor? Thank you. Madam Clerk, would you call the, the uh, first delegation? First delegation is Barris Lodge, here speaking on item five of the Community Services Committee agenda, six line pavement markings. Mr. Lodge, welcome. Council looks forward to your information, but it would assist everybody if you'd come to the microphone. And then the, everyone at home will be able to hear you too. Uh, Mr. Lodge can't be here tonight. There was a, an event that uh, did not allow him to be here. However, we, there was a few of us on our street, including myself, represented the six line <coughs> with that issue that is we're about to talk about. We have this five forwarders, including my wife here. Um, I've been living in Oakville for 31 years. I was here when nothing was around. There was no, the six line was straight until you cut off half of it and make months. I, I, I love Oakville. I moved from Mississauga to here for the past 31 years. We had an incident here with this six line, and I call it an incident because I'm terrified. The markings on six line, there was, when I moved here, there was no markings on the street, there was no roads, there was no sidewalk. We never had a problem. 
the, now the change, the markings on the street, the way it is for parking on the street. Everybody on 6th line from the north, north of Upper Middle Road has a two-car garage. And we have about four parking spaces in our driveway besides the two-car garage. It is beyond me to see that they remark the street and put in parking on either side of the street and on top of that, they put the bicycle lane in the, next to the traffic, the flowing traffic that is on six line. Six line, when I came here, it was very soft. There's not much of a traffic. We didn't even have buses. I remember we had, to, we had meetings about the, the transportation in, in Oakville. And so everything was fine. And until the developer came up, came in and everything went on fine. Nothing, there's still no problem until the markings came in last year when they put them in. I have a problem and so many of the other people on my street getting out of my driveway. And the people who's using the six line does not live on the six line. They come from north, they come from east, and they come from west to escape Trafalgar Road, which is on, now on the construction, but generally it's always blocked up at rush hour traffic. We can get out of our driveway in the morning from, I'd say about eight o'clock until 9.30. And the people who are using the roads, some of them are not conscious. They see you trying to get out. And if I'm going north, I have to be very quick to back my car out to get on the other side before I can start going north. One, they won't let you out, and two, when you're looking up the road, you have to also have to look down the road. I only have one head. I only can look one way at a time. By the time you get out there, the car up is coming up. It is a dangerous, I don't know who, what research they did. I wasn't notified. I've calculated my taxes since I've come here to about $135,000, $136,000 for the 31 years I've been living here. I don't think I, de I deserve to be suffering from this affliction of getting out of my driveway. It's not I alone, there's others. I spoke to a lot of the people in the neighborhood. I canvassed it and they, unfortunately they're not here tonight, some of them perhaps, but I hope that the council, whoever did it, would take a, would take a better look at the people that they're serving. When we elect council members, they are speaking for us. I think when we, and I'm glad, Mayor, when you said we, it's inclusive, it's a community. This is a beautiful town. But you can't just start squeezing us uh, at the expense of what they call development. This is not development. We don't need development on the sixth line. We need the place to go back the way it was. The lines were fine. We had no problem. You have never seen us here in 30 years complain about anything. They remarked the street, and here I am tonight. I could be in some place better than having this meeting. This is not necessary. I would be happy, and so is the other residents that I've spoken to, which is most of the residents on the sixth line, to have them put back the markings the way they were. We were quite happy with it. I don't know who it benefits because there's nobody on the six line need parking. And those two parking lines they put in there, nobody on the six line needs it. Like I said, we have four parking spaces in our driveway and two car garage. We, we need to do something about this. I think if you're going to do something, the, the, the community should be notified, get the input before you. If you're speaking for us, you should know what we're thinking. And I would appreciate if the put back the lines the way they were. Thank you very much for bringing that information. Before you go, are there any questions for the gentleman? Thank you very much, sir, for your information. You. Madam Clerk, the, the next delegation. The next delegation is Janet Haslett Thiel, here from the Joshua Creeks Residents Association to speak to the private tree protection bylaw review, which was item seven on community services. Thank you uh, for coming, Ms. Hazard-Thiel, and Council has your letter, and uh, we're looking forward to your information. 
Well, you have my letter, so therefore I won't take additional time to read it. Um, I just want to add uh, sort of three extra comments because uh, the community services did have a very fulsome discussion about uh, the importance of not only the new private tree bylaw and the great work that was done by the town staff, but also the importance of dealing with uh, homes that are being redeveloped on properties, whether they be by a quote unquote developer or um, by an individual within the building envelope, that that also needs to be addressed. Um, so I won't take important time of yours to reread the letter. Hopefully you've noted it, and hopefully tonight uh, we will proceed with a new private tree bylaw and then some work on uh, protecting the trees under site plan and or uh, another alternative. Thank you very much for your information. Councillor Adams has a question for you. It's not actually a question. It's only a comment that uh, you noted here a, um, a request that we provide some additional information on trees where the ownership is in doubt, for example, boundary trees. Yes. Um, there is already a request to our staff to look at the issue of boundary trees with town trees. So I thank you for that additional comment. Okay, thank you. It's actually a question of staff related to uh, your, your, your letter here. And it's, um, the, the question to staff is, when will we be, we be coming back with a report regarding uh, the issues that have been highlighted, which is more than the just, you know, she's going beyond the private tree bylaw, which is really great, and I appreciate that. Through you, um, Mr. Mayor, I believe um, we've got two important studies still to complete. We've got the Urban Forest Strategic Management Plan to update, as well as the Stormwater Management Plan to complete. And in speaking with my colleagues in development engineering, we're predicting that would come back in the fourth quarter of uh, 2017. I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, the next uh, delegation. The next delegation is Dr. Juliana Casimiri um, from Oakville Green Conservation Association, also here to speak to the private tree bylaw. Welcome, Dr. Casimiri. Council looks forward to your information. Thank you very much, Mayor Burton and Council, um, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, again, my name is Juliana Casimir. I'm the Executive Director of Oakville Green, um, and I have uh, quite a lot of ecology and biology background, so I, I come at this with um, a, a, back, a PhD in community-based forest management. Uh, so in my two years for Oakville Green, we've done a lot of great work. We've planted over 4,000 trees. We've done a lot of urban forest stewardship as well, and we're very proud of that work um, that we can accomplish as a small group with limited resources. And it comes about because we have wonderful uh, staff support and council support, and people in Oakville recognize that urban forests are important. And that is uh, a milestone that I think you should all be proud of. Uh, but when we look at the private tree by law, it... Um, as I said before, if I use the analogy of a, of a tree, it sticks out like a dead branch on an otherwise you know, healthy and growing tree. So it's something that uh, absolutely we support the recommendations uh, made by staff. We were quite involved in all the consultations that went along with that. Um, the primary one that we uh, absolutely support wholeheartedly is the removal of the notification process. Uh, and I brought along my DBH tape tonight to demonstrate that um, at the moment, this is how you measure the diameter uh, at breast height of a tree. And um, if I pull it all the way out, the uh, current um, notification process allows you to take uh, four trees in a year this big. So if we wrap that around, that's, uh, that's a really big hole, <laughs> times four. Um, so we'd like, to, and those are, uh, you can see from the data, that results in uh, about 1% of our urban tree canopy that's been lost, and that was over a four-year period. So not the entire length of like, the history of our tree bylaw, but just in the four years that um, the data was reporting on. And um, I also wanted to say that we... Um, the second thing that we absolutely support is the uh, clarity with the recommendations for compensation that has been put in the bylaw. Uh, we'd love to see that happen as well. And um, I won't take too much more time. I do have a few additional comments in, in addition to what I, what I, uh, the comments that I writ provided to you that were written. Um, so obviously, I would, I would urge you to not delay. And I understand that um, this has to go to budget so that 
uh, you have the resources to properly implement and um, enforce uh, this bylaw, but I would urge the council to ensure that that process does not take uh, too long because we can see the losses happening as we speak. Um, I would also suggest in addition to developing um, a list of native trees um, for, tr for homeowners to, that are permitted to be planted or suggestions to be planted, um, tree species that are native to the region and their requirements. So that makes it easier for homeowners. Um, to go ahead and take that um, step and do the tree planting compensation that's required. I'd also urge you to look to uh, Oakville Green as a partner to developing a, a private tree, plant, tr private tree planting uh, support and incentive program. Uh, and we have many successful models. There's a wonderful one in Toronto um, operated by another nonprofit called LEAF. Um, and we strongly uh, urge you as well, part of the um, um, discussion at community services was, was about invasive trees, in particular buckthorn. Um, so we'd like to see um, buckthorn and invasive species management plan move forward. And I'll be happy to take any questions, but I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your information. Thank you. Would you call the next delegation? Our next delegation is Karen Brock, also from the Oakville Green Conservation Association, to speak to the private tree protection bylaw. Welcome, Ms. Brock. Good evening. Council I'm, looks forward to your information. Thank you. Uh, I'm delighted to be here tonight, so thank you. Uh, we've been waiting for this to come to Council, so it's an exciting day. Uh, my name is Karen Brock, and I'm representing Oakville Green Conservation Association and its members. Oakville Green is a long-time community group, as most of you know, dedicated to protecting and enhancing trees and green space in Oakville. Uh, first of all, I want to express our gratitude uh, to staff, in particular Darnell Lambert, uh, Chris Mark, uh, and Jalil Hashemi, who have spent almost three years and countless meetings to hear from those in the community about tree protection. Thank you for listening to our concerns and recommendations. Way back in January 2014, Oakville Green submitted recommendations to the town signed by, uh, signed by eight other residents associations. After several meetings and discussions, our collective group shared nothing but extreme concern about continued tree loss in our neighborhoods. And uh, I think you've already heard from one of the groups tonight. Uh, Oakville Green supports the long-awaited changes to the private tree protection bylaw, as Dr. Casimiri outlined. Um, the proposed changes make the tree bylaw easier to understand, and I think that's very critical. It would be more effective in protecting trees over 15 centimeters or six inches diameter on private property. Uh, we commend the town for tracking the tree removal data since implementing the current tree protection bylaw in 2008, and I think that was the plan. Okay, now that we've got a bylaw in place, let's start tracking some of this information. But despite best intentions to protect trees, uh, our town is actually losing thousands of healthy trees annually. Most trees were removed without any replanting or compensation requirements. Oakville's canopy cover, as measured by the town's own statistics, has decreased by 1% or approximately 20,000 trees through the free notification process. To me, this proves that the current bylaw is not being effective. I know that Mayor Burton and Council are committed to a target of 40% tree canopy cover by 2057. And to achieve this goal, we need Council to update the town's policy and implement the proposed changes as soon as possible. Uh, Oakville Green, as uh, Dr. Casimiri said, works hard alongside citizens and the town and in planting trees and shrubs. And we've planted 20,000 trees and sh shrubs since 2004, but I see no end to the loss of canopy unless we get bylaw changes approved as quickly as possible. Um, trees are a community asset, and as Mayor Burton says, we're, we're a strong community. Um, and just as clean air and clean water um, are important, so are trees. Trees need the same types of protections. Um, we put in place to keep our air and water healthy for all our citizens. And whether they're on municipal land, private land, school properties, provincial land, 
Trees all work to improve our local environment and are all deserving of equal protection, no matter where they live. Um, and just, I guess this is for the 2017 uh, budget considerations. I believe that'll be one of the next steps. Um, why should we be spending our money on urban forests? Uh, I know there are lots of demands on the taxpayer's dollar. Um, investing our, in our urban forest and green infrastructure, my favorite kind, uh, gives an impressive return on investment. The Green Infrastructure Ontario Coalition uh, quoted from the recent TD Economic Special Report uh, that's included, uh, I believe, in tonight's Appendix A, or it has been. And I quote, Toron Toronto's urban forest provides residents with over $80 million worth of environmental benefits and cost savings. This means that for every dollar spent on annual maintenance, Toronto's urban forest returns $1.35 to $3.20 worth of benefits and cost savings each year. Uh, and thanks to Oakville's 2015 iTree assessment, uh, we know that uh, the replacement value of Oakville's urban forest is $1.02 billion, uh, and that the value of annual environmental services it provides is almost $3 million. Evidence in other jurisdictions shows there will be a meaningful payback for the town for any incremental expenses incurred in amending the tree bylaw. Uh, for example, trees moderate stormwater runoff, decreasing the need for costly stormwater control and treatment facilities. Urban forest planting, maintenance, and protection are also less expensive than traditional stormwater management practices. Many U.S. municipalities have conducted cost benefits analyses and elected to spend millions, I like that, millions on green infrastructure uh, projects instead of billions on expanding treatment capacity and storage within their sewer systems. And as most of you know, there are numerous issues facing our urban forests. Uh, these are things that we have no control over, uh, emerald ash borer being one. But private tree regulation is something that we can control. Green Infrastructure Ontario summarized, our urban forests are under threat and the emerald ash borer infestation is currently wreaking havoc across southern Ontario and we've seen it here in Oakville. Urban trees also face increasingly difficult growing conditions including denser built urban areas and nutrient deficient soils and land development. And in Oakville alone, uh, EAB uh, potentially could kill 200,000 ash trees from our backyards, streets and parks. And I was excited to see in the environmental uh, goals for council that uh, um, there are lots of environmental uh, targets and you're looking to look at tree planting incentives. So that is wonderful. Uh, so I know Oakville is a leader. Municipal and provincial leadership is needed to help Ontario communities grow mature, diverse and healthy urban forests that can help address the extreme weather and urban heat issues associated with climate change. And it's here. Um, and there are some examples cited about uh, the GTA's July 2013 flooding um, that cost insurers $850 million. And of course, closer to home, our Halton neighbours in Burlington suffered dramatic lot, uh, flooding and losses on August 4th, 2014. Um, so regarding budget approval for one and a half full-time uh, equivalent positions, I hope that the above information and stats will convince the budget committee to approve the additional one and a half full-time equivalents of staff to successfully implement the newly proposed bylaw changes and protect our hardworking urban trees. Uh, in closing, it's becoming clear that it's harder and harder for trees to with withstand climate change pressures. Newly planted trees struggled this summer, uh, and the temp temperatures and drought we had this summer are the new normal, and new tree survival is going to prove more difficult. Bottom line, we have to protect the trees that we have. A revamped tree protection bylaw, as, a pro as proposed, will be vastly more effective. Thank you. Thank you very much for your information and your kind remarks. Are there questions for Oakville Green? Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, would you call the next delegation? Next delegation is Bob Lachlan, here from the Oakville Lakeside Residents Association to also speak to the private tree protection bylaw. Welcome, Mr. Lachlan. Council looks forward to your information. 
Thank you. Uh, as you heard, my name is Bob Lachlan. I live at 468 Lakeshore Road East, and I'm here this evening on behalf of the Oakville Lakeside Residents Association. ORLA supports the proposed revisions to the private tree bylaw contained in the staff report. We congratulate and thank Chris Mark and Darnell Lambert for the way in which they organized such effective public consultation to reach the proposed amendment as before you tonight. Is it perfect? There's, there's still work to be done, but it's pretty darn close and well worth supporting at its, as, as, it pretty, as it's currently written. ORLA is particularly happy to see the proposed proposal eliminate the notification process by which anyone could cut four trees per calendar year that were less than 76 centimeters diameter at breast height. So if we imagine somebody cut four trees on December 31st, they could go out on January the 1st and take down another four trees. So a total of eight trees over two days. And the only requirement was to fax notification to the town before starting up the chainsaw. Canopy loss through the notification process was 250,473 square meters over the last five years. Whereas the canopy loss from permits issued for tree removal for the fifth tree in a calendar year or any tree over 76 centimeters diameter at breast height amounted to only 5,852 square meters. Bringing everything under a permitting process will still see measurable canopy loss, but almost certainly less than under the present notification system. There's an opportunity for town forestry staff to discuss the removal with the homeowner and perhaps find an alternative approach that would not require the tree to be removed. Provision is made in the proposed new bylaw for the town to request canopy replacement at the rate of one tree for every 10 centimeters of uh, diameter at breast height of the removed tree. Again, ORLA applauds staff and the proposal they are making and would urge council to pass the amendment to the current bylaw as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much for your information. Councillor Elgar. Mr. Lachlan, would you yeah. be kind enough to take Mr. a Lachlan, question from you, the Councillor? Uh, you mentioned how many trees that were cut that had permits. Can you put it in acres as to how many trees, the total canopy loss, excluding all of the emerald ash borer trees that uh, there are a number of that have been cut? There, there is, well, things I think, were already taken. I, I, I think you did a, that, that at the Community Services Committee and got to a, a, a number of 60 acres. And I'm not quarrelling with you. I haven't done the math, but uh, 200, uh, 260,000 square meters is a lot of canopy. Yeah, 61.89 acres, and all and our tree by law up until this point only say it was 1.76 acres, right? So yes. there's a lot of work to be done. Absolutely. I thank you. Anything else? No. All right, Madam Clerk, would you call the next delegation? Next delegation is Harman Jot Garcha, uh, here to speak with uh, uh, regarding the six line pavement markings. Welcome, Mr. Garcha. Council looks forward to your presentation. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and the Council and the Chamber. My name is actually Manjot Singh, so I'm the person uh, after this. But I'm speaking on behalf of uh, Ms. Garcha and 65 other residents. I have a copy of the letter that I'm actually going to, and we gave a petition of 66 individuals who have signed against the current uh, markings. If you'd like, I'd like to start. Um, I'm, here on, I'm here today on behalf of 66 residents of Six Line who signed the petition opposing the change of current markings that were implemented uh, in December of 2014 uh, on Six Line from Dundas to Upper Middle. Uh, we, the street residents, would like the lane markings to be reverted back to the prior uh, markings from Munns and uh, Upper Middle. Uh, there's a couple of key points. Uh, I was here last week, and uh, there was a presentation we went through, so I'd like to address a couple points uh, from within. Um, there's six key points, 
And the first one is the cost. Um, we were told that it would cost the city $28,000 uh, to have the change, to have the markings reverted back to the ones as before. Uh, first thing is we're not asking the whole street. We're asking from Munns Avenue to, and it shouldn't cost, uh, Munns Avenue to Upper Middle, and it should not cost $28,000. Uh, but more of a point is we spent 28000 or 30000 close to that, without consulting the residents of Sixth Line, and uh, it doesn't seem uh, like it was done in our interest. Um, well, what did it actually yield? Um, it was disappointment for a lot of residents, and we saw in the presentation there was a decrease of three kilometers an hour in certain areas, and in certain areas there were no changes at so, at so whatsoever. So uh, next key point is parking. There's literally no need for parking on Sixth Line. Um, all the houses from Upper Middle to uh, Mons Avenue are fairly big, and they have four uh, four spots for drive, uh, four spots for cars in the driveway, and two car garages. So I don't think anyone has more cars. And if you walk past Six Line, or if you drive by Six Line, you will merely see a single car parked on the entire street. Uh, next thing is speed. Uh, the main issue was brought up that was the changes were implemented because of the speed that was calculated at. 61 kilometers an hour. As of my previous point, um, the, at, in certain areas it's ha it has been calculated at 58 right now, and in certain areas it remains 61. And it seems like uh, 30,000 is a lot of money to to have uh, to make a change for three kilometers an hour. Um, next point is wait times, and no survey can detect that unless you are actually one of the residents. Um, no survey will tell you how much t uh, time or how long we wait in our driveways to get back on the street, especially as a gentleman brought up earlier, um, from a resident of um, Sixth Line brought up earlier, that if we're especially going opposite to the traffic, if we're going up north, it takes us easily in minutes, and I'm talking minutes, like sometimes it could be a little less, it could be a minute, could be 15 seconds, at times it could be five minutes easily, and especially in the mornings when all of us go to work. Um, the next uh, point was that you will hear people constantly honking because there's no middle lane. There used to be a middle lane prior, and there's no middle lane, so people have to wait on the street to turn uh, to their houses. And you'll see people honking, and, um, and there'll be a flock of cars behind them and waiting to go past. And what those people use is the so-called parking lanes we have right now, so people use those to swerve past. And the next thing is we have a lot of senior citizens and young drivers on our street. And, uh, we, and we had a couple of gentlemen speak in the last meeting as well. Uh, and it just cha it's very chaotic for them. Um, we have two senior buildings and then plenty of uh, kids uh, on the street. Uh, another issue was brought up was we made changes because of bikes or bike lanes. Uh, we love bikes. We all ride bikes. And it's summertime, you'll see people like it, going in flocks and flocks, um, going up six line or down six line. We love bikes. We never uh, wanted the bike lanes to be removed. We loved them as they were before. We have been using them for the last years and we never had a, a complaint. And I don't know who would have complained. Maybe a non-resident of six, three, uh, six line might have complained because they had some trouble sometimes, but we never had any trouble. Um, so we love bikes. And we would like, and we, we had bike lanes prior as well, and we would still like them to be reinstated. Um, then the last point um, is it took us a year and 10 months to have this meeting. Uh, this was done in December, and it was um, reported back to uh, our designated ward, uh, ward members and, and ward counselors. And they have been very supportive in this whole cause. And, but for them to have this uh, meeting, take place. It took us one year and 10 months, which seems like an awfully long time. And last, when, when I was here last uh, week, a couple of issues were brought up. One was that we're not getting that many complaints. Yeah, come on, like who would comp keep complaining? We, we don't want to write a letter every, every week for the next year and a half, a uh, year and 10 months, as a matter of fact. Uh, we did raise our issue, and we raised it to the designated board counselors, and they've been very supportive, and they said we're, we're getting a team together. So there's no sense in complaining again and again. Um, so one of the points was brought up that the complaints have reduced. Uh, another point was made up, uh, made by one of the council members, um, that we, we this, these changes have been implemented on other streets. 
and what's, what's like, and technically, what's your problem? Uh, this has, has been done on, well, they didn't say that, of course not, um, but this has been done on, even when we called in December of 2014, we were told, oh, this was done in, on 8th line, this was done on Notting Hill Gate, uh, well, you'll get used to it. That doesn't seem uh, right for an elected member to say that, or, or anyone to say that. Uh, we, we hope that our view counts, or our opinion counts, and that's why we're here. Um, then, there's, I would like to end this with just three points. No one that I know of, or anyone that we have talked to among the 66 members, uh, residents, or anyone they know of, no one had issues uh, from, speed, from speeding from months to upper middle. Uh, no one needed street parking. Uh, there's plenty of driveway space. Uh, and then none of the street residents had problems with biking lanes before. We love bikes and we would like to uh, ride bikes again. And uh, my last statement would be, um, and excuse me and uh, my apologies if it does sound rude and I don't mean to be that way, but uh, a town of, uh, uh, the town of Oakville should have cared to ask the street residents prior to spending $30,000 $30, of our tax money. Does the opinion of the residents of the very street does not matter? We need, we don't want to feel unsafe going in and out of our driveways. We certainly don't need the extra designated parking on the street. The houses have large enough driveways and the townhouses, senior buildings have extra visitor parking within their complex. Thank you, sir. Thank you for a very, very good presentation. Thank you, sir. I, I congratulate you on the, how you've done it. You, you, you might have aroused a couple of questions. I will say that it feels unfair uh, to hear that you, you know your your ward counselors tell you oh we're on it so you don't need to complain and then have someone else use that against you that's got to feel unfair I, I it does. totally sympathize with you on that uh, your ward counselor will be first uh, counselor Noel uh, thank you worship um, uh, first of all I do uh, thank you for raising that point because well well maybe staff aren't hearing the complaints we're certainly hearing the complaints on a regular basis um, both by phone email and even in person so um, Thank you for your presentation today. It was very concise. I really appreciate that. Could you tell me a little bit about the, the uh, demographic makeup of your street? Um, my observation is over the years, I've been counselor there for quite a long time, that it's, it's, a, it's a fairly, um, I'm not going to say elderly street, but there's, there's a lot of, uh, of, of senior citizens that live on that street. Um, in your opinion, do you think that, that, these, that this change and this, this uh, um, a traffic issue would have a stronger impact or a harder impact on those individuals? Absolutely, yes, sir. Um, they, and again, I certainly want to start off by thanking you, and you've been very supportive since the day one, you and Mr. Grant, um, and you've always uh, cared to listen to our opinions and actually emailed us back or called us back. Uh, um, so, yes, absolutely true. Uh, we have a lot of uh, senior citizens, um, and the demographics would normally lie from 40 to, say, I would even say 65. Uh, and plus, when you're uh, including the senior buildings, there's a lot of seniors on the building. Um, we don't have that many young people, but we still do. Uh, and it, it becomes re extremely, extremely hard for them to look back in this way and that way. And, and just getting on the street is a hassle. And we don't want it to be that. Can you maybe describe some of the issues around the fact that the road actually, I mean, I don't know, um, some of my colleagues maybe in the south uh, maybe aren't on six line as often as uh, um, as those of us who live up there are but can you maybe describe the orientation of the street in terms of the um, the, uh, the, the it's not a straight street and and that it, does that I don't want to lead the witness here but does that does that create any additional challenges in your mind I'm very very glad that you brought that up I missed that point so thank you so much um, and this was an issue raised by a lot of people so especially from River Oaks and uh, six line, there's a, there's a bit of a curve around the street. When we had the middle lane, we could actually go in the middle lane and wait. Um, especially for cars coming either way, we could wait and we could be like, okay, now we, we're okay to move and we're okay to proceed in, uh, in such manner. But since we don't have that, especially when we're backing out of our driveways and some of our, some of our folks have uh, started to park their cars the other way around because it makes it a little bit easier. But nonetheless, that curve permits our, so it completely blocks our view from any traffic coming down uh, towards upper middle. So absolutely correct. Thank you, sir. Thank you for bringing that. And, and would that delay your ability to be able to back out? Does that, does, does that, that, that add to the time of your ability to be able to maneuver out of the street, out of the driveway? Uh, yes, sir. Absolutely. And not only that, uh, so we don't have to delay. 
I'll, I'll say that, uh, again, we could merge on our street right away, but that would result in accidents, and plus we don't want to be involved in an accident uh, or any of any sort. Um, even the bikes coming down that, that way, they block, they're actually, we're, our view is blocked of those bikes. Uh, of any trees on there, we love trees again, we don't want anything done with those. Um, and, but I'm just saying that the, the view is blocked in, in the middle lanes, permitted us actually just to settle down, absorb ourselves for a second, okay, now we're okay to move on the street. It could be for people turning uh, left or right, and especially around five o'clock at night uh, or evening, uh, and seven in the morning, eight in the morning, you'll see a whole bunch of people just waiting behind someone because they're turning either to one of the townhouses buildings, either to one of the senior buildings, or especially uh, the six line plaza, which, uh, which is a fairly small plaza, but, uh, but it caters to all, all the residents. Um, all, the, all the local residents. Thank you very much. I appreciate your uh, your time and your presentation. Thank you, sir. May I? Uh, excuse me, Please. Councillor Elgar. Actually, my question is of staff, not uh, the the person presenting right now. I saw. Then, Mr. Singh, thank you very much for thank your you, presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, Councillor Elgar. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, we did spend a lot of time on this at community services, and, and I'm glad we did. And I wonder if, if staff can advise me whether we, they made a mistake doing the active transportation plan that everybody agreed to in 2013. Because tonight I've heard that we have designed a, a street that blocks view and is very dangerous. And I want to know whether that, in fact, is true. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the active transportation master plan uh, was completed in 20, uh, 2009 and uh, identified Sixth Line as a major route for cycling, connecting uh, both uh, locations within the town and connecting us to the broader region. Um, with the use of dedicated uh, bicycle lanes uh, is an appropriate means of providing space for cyclists. Um, and that's a, a method that we've, we've used on, on other streets, similar streets within the town as well. I feel that's an appropriate, that separated, or sorry, that designated bicycle lanes are an appropriate means of providing uh, space for bicycles. So in your opinion, and you're the traffic specialist, you don't believe that we have created a, a dangerous um, issue with regard to six line? Because that's what I, I'm hearing, and I just want to make sure that is not true. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I think there are a couple of questions in there. So with respect to cycling infrastructure, designated bicycle lanes are a safe way to, for bicycle, bicycles, bicyclists to travel. And, to, the, and six line is a very important route. What we're hearing um, is that the removal of the center turn lane, which allowed us to implement the bike lane, is the issue that, that residents are having. It's, so it's not, the, it's not the bike lanes, it's the fact that there's only so much space between the curbs and it's um, the way that we chose to allocate that space that is, is coming up as the concern. So the traffic calming program that was in place prior to this spring uh, incorporated passive traffic calming as the primary method for addressing speed streets um, such as six line uh, major collectors and minor arterials where uh, the traffic speeds were above the threshold that was designated so 60 above 61 kilometers an hour in in this case the approved um, traffic calming uh, mechanism or method was to provide to remove the center turn lane and replace that with two travel lanes one in each direction uh, for cars, one in each direction for bicycles, and the extra space was used for on-street parking. Um, so it, it's not a, a matter of necessarily of the, it's not a matter of the bike lanes being unsafe or of the choice of bike lanes being unsafe. I think the question is whether or not uh, residents feel safer having that space uh, that the center turn lane provided them, so that they could uh, stop and pause, as the the previous speaker mentioned, before merging into an active traffic lane. Okay, I appreciate that. And right now we are, we are going to do another active transportation master plan study going forward. Through you, Mr. Mayor, that's correct. Um, the active transportation master plan update is, is ongoing and uh, we have public consultation events planned for this Thursday. Um, 
as one step in that process. The plan will come before you early in 2017 for your approval. Which brings me to my last question, which goes to the first question. We heard tonight that there, it, we, the public was excluded all input. Were, were there no, was there ever any public engagement related to our last active transportation master plan? Through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, there was public consultation as part of the 2009 tra uh, active transportation master plan and the transportation master plan itself, so, uh, shifting gears. Um, the con for the passive traffic calming program that was uh, approved, uh, there was a, a list of projects that were approved. Residents were notified in advance of each of the projects that were to be implemented. I, I can't say that, um, that that would constitute consultation on that. That predates my time with the town. But I can say that I know that everyone was no within that stretch of the street um, was uh, provided with a letter that showed them what the, uh, the proposed changes uh, to the road would be. I thank you for the information. Thanks. Okay, so there's a lot of interest in this topic, and I'm running two lists, first-timers and second-time uh, speakers and questioners. And the next uh, councillor to be recognized is Councillor Grant. Thank you. And given that we keep talking about the active transportation master plan and cycling, if I could call you back up, I'm sorry. Could you tell me what the width of the cycle lanes are right now with the two-lane configuration? Or I could tell you if you'd like. Yeah. Through you, Mr. Mayor, they're in the report. I believe it's 1.75 meters. When we had three lanes on that street, what was the width of the cycle lane? When we had three lanes on the street, they were edge lines, and they were 1.8 meters, but they were used as a signed bicycle route. Therefore, if we were to return to the three-lane configuration, we still have 1.8 meters to work with in order for a safe bicycling. Yeah. Through you, Mr. Mayor, the, the difference between the bike lanes and the bike route is that parking was allowed over top of those edge lines um, at certain times of the day. Today, the parking is in a separate space, and so the bike lanes should be clear at all times for cyclists. Those are the two differences. But again, if we don't have parking on that street at all, from Munns down to upper middle, then we're... Through you, Mr. Mayor, if the parking was removed, then this, they could be bike lanes. And I appreciate you letting me do committee work at council. Thank you very much. Um, let me just try this on, uh, so Councillor Duddock is next, and then Councillor Lischina, then Councillor Lapworth, and then Councillor Knoll. Um, but it sounds to me, as your chair, that we're really sort of debating the item, and we haven't even separated it yet. So how do you feel about moving to see if it's separated, and then having the debate, rather than having it now? Because that was the last of the uh, delegations. So is that, is that, and I'll keep the same list that, that I have here. So then uh, uh, on uh, the administ on this, on this, so that brings us to the standing committee reports. On, on ASC, is there a movement seconder for that report? Councillor Knoll moves it. Councillor Giddings seconds it. All those in favor? Opposed to Finney? ASC passed. Good work, ASC. On CSC is, uh, I gather we want to separate uh, this item item five, and uh, do we have a mover and seconder for the balance? Your Worship, I'd also like to, I'd like to separate the tree bylaw for a recorded vote. Also. All right, so uh, we're <coughs> separating, let me just catch up here. We're separating item seven and item five, and Ad Councillor Adams has moved the balance. I'm looking for a seconder. Councillor O'Meara, thank you very much. All those in favor? Opposed to Finney, and that's carried. And now, um, is there discussion on the tree bylaw? No, no discussion. I just want the recorded vote. Will the same mover and seconder be moving the tree bylaw? Then to be recognized, that's a yes. So to be recognized on this vote, I'll first call the yeses. And those in favor, please stand to be named. <coughs> oh my goodness, look at that. It's. Uh, Looks like a full house. Councillor Lischina, Councillor Adams, Councillor Grant, Councillor Noel, Councillor Lapworth, Councillor Elgar, Mayor Burton, Councillor Giddings, Councillor Chisholm, Councillor Duddock, and Councillor O'Meara. I, I won't call the negatives. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any. Um, congratulations, everyone. Uh, we didn't have that much unanimity when we passed the first one. No, I really haven't at all. <laughs> um, 
Now, uh, item number five. Uh, Councillor Duddick, you're next. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, given that this item is separated, um, perhaps we would benefit by having um, Jill present her presentation for the benefit because there seems to be a misunderstanding that this is solely about the bike lanes, but there is definitely a traffic calming component due to safety concerns in the 85 the percentile. I don't know, if, I just think it would be helpful for those who are sitting in and watching to get Thank the you. full. Thank you very much. Uh, anything else? Because we'll, we'll, it's certainly on anyone's request, we're, we're free to do that. Councillor Lischina. Uh, mine is just a follow-up question for Jill uh, with respect to what Councillor Grant said about the parking. Do we have any count of how often the street parking is used? And um, we heard in the presentation that uh, the residents don't need it, so who's parking there? Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, no, I don't have uh, numbers or daily... Uh, okay, I have to interrupt that. I'm sorry, but I, I'm listening to everybody being Sir. so approvably sent. Yes, but I'm a visitor right now. Sir. And I live here for 20 years, Sir. and I cannot sit here and listen any longer to all this that is coming from town. Well, okay, because she said she doesn't know, and I know. But you don't live, give anybody a chance. He lifted his hand. The other person lifted, you don't give anybody a chance. So I have to interrupt, because this is my responsibility as a citizen. Are you giving me a chance, or you let me sit down and then you direct me when? Because she said she doesn't know. I don't have to learn, because I live here since 1985, you were not mayor yet, and I was living here, and I seen what was happening, and it's happening wrong. If you want to be ejected, keep interrupting. Otherwise, please be patient. Okay, so you direct me when I can speak. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I ask a question for staff? Six line, six line north of upper middle. There's a school, and I'm just in calculating your 61 uh, kilometers per hour. Was that calculated during school hours or outside of school hours, or is it a mean average in the middle? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, the, the calculated speeds are based on either 24 or 48 hour uh, traffic counts. So it would be uh, at least one full day's worth of counts, if not two hours, and, and average over it. The, uh, the speed that's uh, presented on the, uh, in the report is the 85th percentile speed, so 85% of traffic is traveling at or below that speed. Councillor Noll, it's your turn. Councillor Duddick is gesticulating wildly. She's, okay. Um, so my first question is, uh, with respect to um, the proposal that uh, was suggested at uh, CSC and defeated, which is to uh, um, a modification of number one, which is to change the, or the, the lanes from upper middle to um, MUNS. Can you uh, help us understand, does that, does, in your opinion, does that constitute a, uh, a tr a, 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 any kind of safety issue? Through you, Mr. Mayor. The, the pavement markings that are in place today are representative of uh, what was approved through the Passive Traffic Calming Program. They're in place to try and reduce the operating speed of the road and uh, through that allowed us to also um, take that reallocated space and provide on-street parking and bike lanes. I do not, we do not have um, Collision history, based on the last year, to say that the that the changes are unsafe. Um, I am very hesitant to use the words safe and unsafe, um, or safer and 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 less safe, for example. Um, 
the road prior to the, the changes was designed to appropriate municipal standards. It just didn't meet the traffic calming um, lane markings that, uh, that have been, been previously put in place and recommended on, on similar streets. So to re return the pavement markings would be to say um, that the passive traffic calming was not required on that stretch. It would not be a, um, a commentary on safe or unsafe or more safe or less safe. So let, um, let me approach from a different position. Before the, uh, the TMP was in place and the decision was made to proceed with, the, uh, um, uh, with the, the new lane changes, was there at that time um, any kind of uh, um, history of collisions or problems um, that were to be addressed? Or what, was, that, was, that part of the, was that part of the rationale for making the changes? For you, Mr. Mayor, this was a passive traffic calming program. It was not a collision uh, reduction program. Okay. Uh, it was based on operating speed of the roadway. Okay, so let me um, let me take this a little bit farther. Then, so in terms of so, if, if we, we were we were not addressing any potential safety issues in terms of collisions. Now, in terms of the success of the program, you, you met, tested before and after, and before. It was in the 85th percentile, and after it appears, it's also in the 85th percentile with a slight difference in kilometers per hour. It was, I think, it, depending on where you were in the street, it was between one and three kilometers an hour difference. Is that accurate? Three, Mr. Mayor. That's correct. Is that a, is that a significant um, um, is that a significant improvement, um, or is it potentially even a rounding error? Three, Mr. Mayor. It's within the. Uh, are what we would expect to see with passive traffic calming. Uh, passive traffic calming is not typically, um, we do not see the, typically this, the, the same dramatic changes in speed uh, reduction as we would with a physical measure, which forces somebody to slow down because they may, because they have to, to move uh, over or around right. uh, an obstacle. So, um so I've asked about the, the safety issue, and, um, and that wasn't the issue in terms of the, it wasn't, it wasn't done to respond to safety concerns with respect to collisions. Um, we've had a minor change in, in a number of kilometers per hour in terms of the most recent test. What, um, what, about, the, um, uh, what about the issue around uh, volumes? Did you, did you any t did any testing around volumes? Did it change volumes of traffic on the street? For you, Mr. Mayor, we did, uh, with our speed counts, we do uh, also look at volumes. Uh, the volumes are within the range that we would expect on that type of road. Um, with Trafalgar um, sort of out of commission at, at points uh, last year and this year, when we were doing our speed surveys, I'm hesitant to, to uh, provide too much commentary on the volume because I think uh, right. there, that it would be. That would skew it, obviously. Yes. Um, so, okay, so we've identified the safety one. Now, what about the issue around, uh, uh, again, I know this was done as a result of the master plan. Was there, was there any substantial um, evidence of concern regarding speed on that portion of Six Line that, that, that Councillor Grant and I are, are, mostly, are mostly addressing at this moment? Did you have any kind of uh, um, citizen uh, registry of complaints on that issue? For you, Mr. Mayor, it was the this our speed survey program, uh, which uh, put the the street on the on the list, and uh, as we worked our way through the list and, and implementing passive traffic calming, um, we did have and con have concerns uh, with respect to speed and with respect to to vehicles um, using the center turn lane inappropriately, um, and uh, those. Those can both be accommodate or sorry addressed through uh, passive traffic calming. I understand that, but but in terms, we didn't have any constituent concerns. So there wasn't any kind of uh, outcry or petitions or anything from constituents to say the road's too fast or or the the road's a problem up to that point. Correct. Uh, through you, sir, uh, Mr. Mayor, we did receive some some complaints over over time, but uh, um, we received complaints on. Just about every road that the speed is oh, uh, true. is too fast. True. Yeah. I mean, it would probably be surprising if you didn't receive a complaint at, on some road. Yes. In terms of the cost, so we, we know that to return the entire uh, six line to the tr original configuration is twenty eight thousand dollars. What's the cost to return only the portion from upper middle to um, Munns? 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's approximately twenty thousand dollars. I believe it's not it's not a fifty fifty split in terms of uh, of the length, even though the length is approximately half. It's just due to the amount of of paint and signs that are in that stretch, and uh, and just the overall getting folks out there to do the work. There's uh, you can't just divide the cost in half. Okay. Okay. That's all I have for now, Your Worship. I do have comments when we come to motion time. Councillor Duddick. Well, then let's do that now. Ms. Stevens, are you prepared to uh, unfurl your presentation? Can we access podium user? to go back to um, to go back to CSC. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the committee, or members of council. Sorry, this is uh, the same presentation that I made at committee, so the the date is. A little off from today. So sixth line uh, was uh, previously identified as qualifying for passive traffic calming based on the observed 85th percentile speeds as, as we've just mentioned. Um, in September of 2014 this stretch of sixth line between Upper Middle Road and Glen Ashton and River Glen was resurfaced. And at that time, we restriped the road to provide those passive traffic calming measures. In December of that year, we were asked to report back to Council on the steps necessary to return Six Line to its pre-2014 configuration of three lanes for motorized vehicles and two lanes for bicycles. And so we prepared the report that went to CSC on Tuesday. I'll show this uh, in photographs in just a moment, but this is uh, uh, a graphical representation of what the pavement markings looked like before. We had the uh, 1.8 meter edge lines, as we've mentioned, 3.7 meter um, wide travel lanes and a center turn lane. The current pavement markings consist of, a, uh, of parking lanes on either side, a 1.75 meter bicycle lane and 3.25 meter wide uh, motorized vehicle lanes. This is uh, the sixth line um, at uh, Rother Glen School in the northbound direction before the pavement markings were put in place. This is the same uh, or similar location um, this year. This is uh, a northbound sixth line again, but uh, further north by Holy Trinity uh, before the pavement markings were changed. And this is a similar uh, stretch of the road uh, today. So you can see how the pavement markings have changed with the removal of the center turn lane, the addition of the, the parking, and the addition of the bike lanes. One of the reasons that we took the extra time before reporting back to committee and council was to allow us to do some uh, monitoring of the speeds to see whether those had changed as a result of the implementation of the passive traffic calming measures. As is outlined in the report, the, uh, the re um, passive traffic calming is implemented when uh, this, the operating speeds are 61 or higher. Uh, in this case, you, uh, you can see now based on the uh, speed surveys that we conducted in 2015 and 2016 that the uh, operating speeds are between 58 and 61. So there have been some changes uh, and some areas are remaining uh, the same or, or close to the same. So the staff report, um, as I mentioned, was uh, as a, res a result of a request to staff to report back. And uh, the request was that uh, we review the pavement markings um, and, uh, oh sorry, my apologies. This, the recommendation of today's report is uh, that uh, the pavement markings um, as detailed in the, uh, the report uh, be received. The report discussed two options, reintroducing the pavement markings to the pre-2014 condition or maintaining the current pavement marking plan. 
We did also, though, talk about a hybrid option, which, would, which has been mentioned uh, uh, by the Ward 5 councillors uh, tonight already, and that would be to leave uh, the, the northerly section as it is, and, and the southerly section would be returned to the pre-2014 condition. By reintroducing the pavement markings, um, this stretch of six line becomes a bike route instead of having be designated bike lanes. Uh, the active transportation master plan shows this as being a, a route that would have bike lanes. As I mentioned before, uh, the, the key difference here is that uh, before when it was a bike route, there was some parking allowed over top of the bike space and, des and bike lanes are designated facilities that are available full time. With the previous pavement markings, there was some on-street parking permitted uh, with some peak hour restrictions, uh, and that parking took place within the, the, the edge lines and a uh, portion of the travel lane, which is the space that was used by bicycles prior to uh, the changes. Uh, with the, pre with uh, the previous pavement markings reintroduced, there are limited options for additional traffic calming if it was determined that traffic calming is, is required, and the estimated cost to return the full section is 28000 we men I mentioned earlier is approximately 20,000 to do the smaller portion. The, uh, if we maintain the current pavement markings as they are, that's consistent with our, our passive traffic calming program and the way we have provided passive traffic calming on other major collectors and minor arterials in town. It's also consistent with the active transportation master plan and the ongoing update and the recommendations that uh, have been um, drafted so far for that, and obviously there is no cost. And the hybrid option is a combination of those, those two, as I've mentioned. So the direction that was provided to staff in 2014 was to re report back to council on the steps necessary to return six line from Upper Middle Road to Dundas to its pre-2014 uh, configuration of three lanes for motorized vehicles and two lanes for bicycles. Uh, staff recommended that the report uh, that went to CSC be received and that we would need direction if changes to those pavement markings were, to, were required. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Ms. Stevens? I have one then. If there are. Councillor Chisholm, Councillor Giddings. Um, through you, Your Worship, the, the parking, the, the par are these parking stalls or are they just lines on, on the road? Because I looked at the, uh, it went too quickly. Oh, sorry. I, I, if we can get back to that, I'd like to, on the visual to look at that. Okay. So what's the setback of the parking from the driveways of, of some of the residents that they're so concerned about, I believe, sight lines? How far, is there a setback on, between the driveways? Yeah. Three, Mr. Mr. Mayor, um, parking is not uh, allowed within one meter of, of a municipal of a driveway, according to our bylaws. Okay, but what I'm what I'm asking is, there, are there markings on the road for that, or is it just that's just no, it's a free for all? Uh, Three, Mr. Mayor. No, we did look at at, uh, at markings, and and there are areas where to provide the left turn lane, we had to um, adjust the markings so that would adjust the parking available space and things like that. So yes, that was all considered. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, uh, Julie, you mentioned that there were examples of motorists using the center turn lane inappropriately. Could you just paint a little picture for that for me in terms of what kind of actions? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, examples of that would be impa impatient drivers trying to, uh, to get around and get where they wanted to go faster than then the folks who were in the driving properly would let those folks behind them get. So they could be coming out and using that as a, as a passing lane or an acceleration lane to get to the, this, the left turn opportunity. Um, Ms. Stevens, uh, can I ask you about the provision of parking on the street? In these different options, uh, is there a requirement on council to provide parking on that street? I, I, I thought I heard the residents to say they didn't need parking on the street. Why do we, I, I had the sense from the report and again, that we have to have parking. Uh, can you uh, shed some light on yeah. that? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
I would say that no, there's no requirement to have parking. We have not done any consultation with residents to ask them whether or not they would like that parking. Um, we know that it, it sometimes it is used. We've heard from the residents that are here today that it's not used as often as it is on, on many other streets where they don't have the, the ability to park in their driveways or, or uh, garages. Um, but what we, what we try to do with this uh, set of pavement markings is, uh, is allocate the space so that um, there are fewer opportunities for folks to, to speed, to um, try and duck around folks um, so by providing a dedicated space for cycling and a dedicated space for, for parking, it's, it's hoped that drivers will respect what is meant by the lane markings and they'll, they'll, they'll stay where they're supposed to be for the purposes that they're there. And we, that's one of the reasons we narrowed the driving lanes as well. So we heard tonight that, uh, I think what we've heard tonight is that we had objectives uh, with regard to this effort that we did and <laughs> Uh, number one and number two I'm not sure that we achieved much change with regard to getting objectives and the second thing I think I heard you allow was that we couldn't really say the residents had been consulted more like notified and um, and we heard in third we heard from the residents that you know sounds like all of them but but more than 60 anyway have found their convenience reduced as a result of our our, our efforts on their behalf. And that's sort of the way it sums up for me. So, um, and I, I, I'm taking you for agreeing with that. And this is your chance to say no, I distorted you if I okay. did, but I no. think I've got you. No, through you, Mr. Mayor, that's, that's accurate. I would just add, if I may, that with, uh, when we changed the, the uh, traffic calming procedure in 2008, we, um, we as staff were permitted to do more notification than consultation with the understanding that traffic calming was something we were doing for our residents. And, uh, and so that we did follow the procedures that were in place at the time. Our new procedure does add that consultation back in. Okay, so in that spirit, would staff welcome an opportunity to um, review this matter with real public consultation with the residents to see what the best way to achieve everyone's objectives are, rather than council make a decision tonight, would it be, uh, would it be the best outcome to ask staff to, to have a consultative approach with, with, the, with the residents? Or would council continue to recommend that we just receive the report? Through you, Mr. Mr. I'm sorry. Through you, Mr. Mayor, we do have opportunities um, to consult on on um, the the bike lane, the bike route component of this uh, through the active transportation master plan that's coming up Thursday. Um, if we were implementing this today under our new process, it, it would be um, definitely a consultative process. Um, we certainly have heard the comments that have come out from the public. I, uh, my, my concern is we want to just ensure that we are addressing any technical needs that we, we come across, whether they're, they are traffic calming related and uh, the active transportation component. I, uh, we will be continuing to recommend the, the bike lanes uh, through the ATMP update. So with that understanding then certainly Okay, uh, Councillor Duddick, you appear to want the floor, and so does Mr. Green. Do you want to go before or after Mr. Green? Mr. Green. Uh, to you, uh, Your Worship, I think at this point, and, and as you know, I do live up not far from the area. I think the pavement markings actually works well. You, you have heard the, the, uh, uh, the issues of the public, though, and, and it sounds like there's a considerable number, according to the petition. So I think really going through another set of consultation, I'm not sure on this would actually change staff's mind versus the residents. So I believe it would be best decided by council. Thank you, Mr. Green. Councillor Dunnick. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, and I guess building on that, I concur with what uh, 
CAO Green had just said, I guess my concern would be is if we did go to a consultative process, um, how do we reinforce the safety, the speeding? Like those are warrants that we have to have due regard for. In other words, it's not a case of picking and choosing based on what somebody says they like this or they like that. We look at it through the lens of what's in the best interest for the entire community, what's the safest way to slow down the speed without doing, as you say, the more intrusive medians, things of that nature. Um, and it sounds like the traffic calming is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And we do have a designated bike route versus, or a bike lane rather, versus then a bike route. Um, so I'll just leave that. That was really a question, but I appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor Duddick. Um, Council, oh, let's see. Hands, please. So, <laughs> Councillor. Councillor Adams is a first timer, so Councillor Adams. He picked me, he picked me. Um, to what degree has the cycling community been consulted on a potential change back to the original format? Um, if at all. Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, the cycling community itself has not been consulted on this. We have spoken with the consultants from our active transportation master plan update and um, they are continuing to recommend that this be a that this road have cycling lanes. So we ha so we don't have anybody here from the cycling community because nobody in the cycling community thinks that we're thinking of changing this. Um, so to make a decision to go back um, without consulting another group of Oakvillians, I think would in a way also be unfair. So I'll I'll leave that. Councillor Grant. <clears throat> and so let's circle back to what I was trying to get to earlier. Um, are not uh, a, a hard cycle lane is a form of a active transportation master plan and it's also traffic calming, is it not? Through you, Mr. Mayor, a designated bicycle lane is used for both of those purposes, yes. And, and the motion that I made last Monday was the fact, or Tuesday, sorry, I forgot Thanksgiving. Um, it was the fact that we want to keep it as a cycle lane. I know a number of cyclists who do use that. Uh, we've already heard that parking is not a necessity in the area. And so to turn the entire area, or to at least make sure that that 1.8 meters is a hard cycle lane uh, was really what I was trying to get to. In fact, I'd spoken to Mr. Uh, Kaplan or Clapham earlier uh, in the month about trying to get green paint down the side of the street so we can make sure the drivers understand, much like they have around the Ninth Line area, uh, get drivers to understand this is a cycle lane you're not supposed to be driving in that area and and if we were to implement something like that then that would also be a form of traffic calming uh, through you mr mayor uh, it it would provide yes cycling lanes uh generally though are, are cycling lanes are used as traffic calming or can be used as traffic calming it's that extra space and what do we do with it and does that allow us to also reduce speeds? That is the question. And, and certainly when we're talking about um, returning to a three lane configuration, uh, we can certainly also consider the fact that we can make the lanes a little bit larger by reducing the lanes for the cars. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, the cycling lanes. Yes. Making those wider. Thank you. Um, Councillor Elgar and then Councillor Lischina. I'm not sure where we're going with this, but either either we go with the, the master plan or we quit working on the 2016-2017 master plan, which is costing thousands of dollars to do to do it accurately. Read the report from the traffic experts. I am not a qualified tech traffic uh, expert, but I do read that they were saying that the previous payment markings did not conform to the town's traffic calming procedure. If you go through the report again, they highlight like it doesn't meet the livable oak bill plan, it doesn't meet the active transportation master plan, and we're sitting here piecemealing it as if we're going to have a piecemeal active transportation plan. And as a councillor, then I say we forget all about any of these active transportation plans until we get the fundamentals right. So when we get to vote, if we vote to change it back, 
then we should put a full stop on the active transportation plan going forward also because the piecemeal approach doesn't work for consistency. And I, I think you said the other night, another reason, you need consistency of flow on the, on this, on the street so that people know what markings mean. And, and that is given the consistency. Yes. And I, I, I really can't believe that we're spending this long, and it's good that we are, but we, we have to come together on whether we're serious about an active transportation plan or we're not. So uh, I look forward to the vote, uh, and we'll have a recorded vote, because I'm going to ask the mayor for that for sure, and uh, we'll, we'll see where it goes. But uh, I thank you for your report. You. I, know, I know that you've done a lot of work on it, and it's not easy. So these are hard decisions we're going to have to make. Thank you. Councillor Lischina. I just wanted to uh, um, echo Councillor Grant, indicating that uh, we have our, we're not talking about removing cycling lanes. And in our ward, we do have sections where they're very nicely uh, marked with green, and in other sections, there's not enough to have the car uh, and a full space for the, the bicycle with the green lane. So uh, it's not continuous throughout the town and every road. So um, considering what's happening in, in this section, and I walk that area as well when I cross the boundary from Ward 6 to Ward 5. Um, that, that ending right by upper middle where the curve of the road, it, it sometimes does scare me when there's not a middle lane to get out and, and um, take a pause in, in order to be, to be able to get back onto the road in a safe manner. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, I would support an outcome where we had the dedicated bike lanes consistent with the, the active transportation master plan. So we wouldn't have to worry about notifying the bicycling community because they would still have their, their, their lanes they have now. And I would support uh, a package, I guess, that would uh, restore a center lane, which is what I heard people to say, and, and I would support uh, removing the parking where it was necessary to make that work. And then I believe we would be balancing the objectives of our active transportation master plan, our livable Oakville plan, and all of those things. And we would be also uh, respecting the convenience of our residents. I, I, um, I don't really see it as destroying any of the principles of the active transportation master plan. My focus is on restoring the convenience of the residents with regard to their center lane. And, and I'm taking their, their um, evidence that they don't want the, the parking, which would, uh, which would then permit, if anything, bigger bike lanes. Um, and I had hoped with my suggestion of sending it for true consultation, we would then also respect the fact that this was done before we changed the marching orders of staff and, and added a requirement for consultation, not uh, notification. And, um, uh, and I thought uh, that staff might be alive to the possibility of this hybrid hybrid where we keep the active transportation uh, master plan bike lanes and uh, and all we do is restore the center lane and we restore the, co the convenience of the residents. And, uh, the, uh, and, and there, I'm, I'm done. That's just my preference. I don't have a sense of how it would go, but I could, I could put my name on a vote like that. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I don't know if we've um, come to the point where we're going to be voting or whether you're going to be waiving the procedure bylaw to let the gentleman come forward and delegate before we vote on the issue. Well, we don't have a motion yet. And I, I will move the recommendations from the committee, and if so, I would uh, speak to that. That's fine. I need a seconder. Councillor Elgar seconds it. Uh, okay. Councillor Duddick, you can speak. Um, we dealt with this at length at uh, uh, Community Services. Um, it was interesting, your comments, Your Worship, that you talked about convenience. And I have a problem when it comes to safety on the road. 
being deemed as convenience. It's the safety of the residents, the speed. Speeding's happening all over Oakville. We all realize that. What we're trying to do is to mitigate the speeding issues that are currently happening throughout the town without being as intrusive as hard um, infrastructure to deal with traffic calming. It's interesting, nobody's commented on the uh, Rother Glen uh, Montessori School that in the uh, body of our report, they had concerns at one point. Staff worked with them. They no longer have problems with it. So a busy school that is also dealing with safety of uh, students and parents and families are pleased with it. So um, let's keep that in mind. Because of the discussions that we had the last week, um, I made a point of going up past this area several times. And lo and behold, there were parking of cars on that stretch of roadway. So it's not a scientific survey, okay? But I did want to see whether in fact people actually are utilizing the parking lanes that are being provided. And uh, as such, um, I am still in keeping with our decision that we made at committee. Um, I think it's important that uh, safety is paramount and uh, I would hope that the rest of the committee would support. Thank you, Councillor Delegate. Councillor Elgar? No, I, we've ragged the puck enough. Uh, I'm ready for the vote. Councillor Noel? Oh, but not quite yet. Um, <laughs> So uh, I'm, I'm asking members of council to uh, consider defeating this um, uh, resolution and um, um, let's look at a hybrid between what Councillor Grant had proposed and what the mayor is suggesting because I think that there is a, there's a solution in there. I have a number of points I want to raise and I'll try to go as quickly as I can but I think they're all very important. Um, and a couple of them are to respond to some things that uh, my colleague said. So first of all, um, uh, I live very close and I'm on this road probably four to six times a day, just the nature of, of our work. I'm up back and forth and I'm there all times of day, during rush hour, during uh, slow times, late at night, et cetera. So I, I see the various uh, uh, issues on that road. Um, I, I live them. There's a couple really important points. First of all, to respond to Councillor um, uh, Duddick's comment about she sees parking on the street. You know why people park on that street? They park on the street to avoid backing out. So you actually find residents who will actually park on the street early in the morning so they don't have to actually back out when it gets busy. Um, so it, we actually, if anything, I've, I've seen more parking on the street as a result of this because they're actually trying to, they're trying to mitigate their, their problems actually getting in and out of the car. Um, now going on some of the big issues that were addressed, then the first and foremost, the, the number one issue that we always have to address, the staff have to address, we have to address, everybody has to address and face is safety. That comes first and foremost no matter what, full stop, end of story. But I've heard nothing today that demonstrates that safety has been increased by any substantive measure that's really measurable. One or two kilometers is not really a measurable or demonstrable safety uh, benefit. In fact, if anything, it could simply be luck of the draw based on time that, uh, um, uh, time that it was actually done. In fact, in fact, the only safety issue that I've heard demonstrate today is the safety issue that's been raised by the residents who are expressing serious concern, not inconvenience, I hate that word. It's, it's an inconvenient truth here. No, I'm just kidding. It's, it, the fact is that the, the, the residents are demonstrating through their, their, their description of their experiences a safety issue. And I see that every day. And I see people all of a sudden gunned out of the driveway and people screeching to a halt because they just get frustrated. And in terms of the center lane being a lane that people use to go around cars, they still do that. But now they're in the opposing lane. Because when you've got somebody backing out, especially somebody who may not be totally secure, in terms of uh, they're not totally comfortable backing out, they go slow. And it just totally drags the street to a crawl. When people are trying to get to their GO train or whatever, they just, they just go around the corner. They don't worry about it. So it, it, on this issue is a nominal speed decrease. We haven't heard any demonstration. When I asked the director in terms of the, the safety issue, she wasn't really able to demonstrate any safety issue, either pro, pro or, or for or against. So that's, that's my biggest issue. Um, in addition to what we heard from residents, and I, 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 I ferreted out this, this question because I, I have spent a lot of time in 16 years canvassing that street and meeting our residents and talking to people. There are a lot of senior citizens in that street. And one of the fundamental things that we as a, as a community try to do is we always want people to be able to remain in their homes as long as possible. This is a quality of life issue. You can, if you, as soon as you start losing your mobility 
And this is a mobility issue. If you can't pull out of your driveway safely, you're now suddenly starting to think about getting rid of the car and possibly not having that, that mobility issue. And that's a serious concern. As we are aging as a society, uh, and, and Oak, that part of River Oaks is, is one of the oldest parts of River Oaks, and it's 30 years plus now. There are some original residents still there. So there are seniors there that are, very, uh, that are very concerned about this. And I heard about it in spades during the election. Literally, it was almost the number one issue for a period of time during the last election because it just happened to happen during the election. Thanks, staff. Um, but, uh, um, and and, we, and we, I, I don't think a day went by that we weren't pilloried with this as a, as a question. Um, I want to emphasize that we're only looking at a portion of the road here. There's really only one portion of the road that's sub substantially impacted. The rest of the road is either a school, they have, it, uh, they have uh, cross streets that, that connect, at, or for that matter, the, the, the few houses that exist between Trinity School and Glen Ashton actually have the ability, they have um, the, the garage in the back, so they can actually turn around and pull out in, in a normal configuration. Some do back out, but it's not the same situation. So we're really only concerned about that strip that one strip from Upper Middle Road to Munns. The next piece uh, I want to emphasize, and I, 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 again, I asked the, staff, uh, the, uh, uh, the residents to, to describe this issue, and that is that the, the specific orientation of the street with the curve really does create a, a sightline issue. Um, and, and, I can, and I've tried backing out of driveways, and I've seen that sightline issue. There's certain points in the, uh, along the street where you just can't see what's coming on at all. So in some cases, you have to do a right out so that you can go north. You had to have to take a right out and go around a side street and come back up because you just don't have the visibility. When they had the center lane, they had that ability and that safe haven. As Councillor Grant pointed out, there is, an, or there is a solution. There always has been a bike lane and there's a solution to maintain that bike lane as you yourself point out and thank you for that, Your Worship, and thank you to Mark Grant for uh, raising that as well. Not all roads are alike. I, I like this. I like the, the, uh, the changes on some of the roads. I think on 8th line it was brilliant. Uh, when that came up, I remember it back in the day, and that may have been the road we piloted this on. Um, and and in, some, in some cases, it really works. River Glen, it really works well, too. But not all roads are created equal. Councillor Elgar talked about abandoning the whole process. Well, I, I don't agree with that either, because not every road can have this application applied to it. So we, we're not necessarily going to abandon the entire process because we're, we're, we're saying this, it doesn't work on this road. We're just being flexible. Glen Ashton, another one of our roads, has a very similar situation. The solution on Glen Ashton is they painted Sherrows on the road. And, it's, and, it, and it seems to work fine. I'm not, getting, I'm not getting any sort of mass complaint. And there's a lot of bikes on Glen Ashton. I dare say there's more bikes on Glen Ashton than there are on Six Line. That's my experience. It's a very popular bike route. Um, that's re so that, 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 really, that really is the, the uh, summary of my most important points. And I go, I'm gonna end going back to the beginning just to remind everybody because I was long-winded here. We are all about safety first, and, and again, I just want to draw your attention to the fact when you're voting today, remember that nobody today, nobody in the report has really demonstrated any significant safety issue. The only evidence we have on safety, Your Worship, today is the, is the evidence that is presented by the residents, 60 odd residents, which is more than the majority of the residents on that strip, have, have expressed their concern that this is a safety issue in their minds. So if it's not a demonstrated engineering safety issue, it's certainly a safety issue in the minds and hearts of the people who live on that street, drive on that street, pay taxes on that street, and I really think that we should give that some serious consideration. So again, I ask for your consideration to defeat this motion and allow us to try a hybrid. Thank you, Councillor Grant. Uh, no, Councillor Grant. I would be a fool to try and follow that, so I'm just going to leave it. Are there... Are there other speakers? Then I'll call the vote. All those in favor of Councillor Duddock's motion to uphold the committee, please rise to be named. Councillor Adams, Councillor Lapworth, Councillor Elgar, Councillor Giddings, Councillor Chisholm, Councillor Duddock, and Councillor O'Meara. Opposed? <laughs> Councillor Lischina, Councillor Grant, Councillor Knoll, Mayor Burton. We, the few, the small, have lost. <laughs> And I declare the motion carried. Uh, Council, that uh, brings us to our first consent items, and that is your uh, Oakville Enterprises quarterly report and your 2017 Council and Committee schedule. And uh, um, I would ask if you need the present, the, uh, there's a presentation from Mr. Lister for your edification. 
And uh, there's also a report already in your package. What's your pleasure? Councillor O'Meara. Uh, if, uh, uh, if my colleagues are okay with I'd be happy to move both uh, consent items uh, if, if, uh, without seeing the presentation, if, if that's Let's see doable. if there's a seconder. Councillor Adams is your seconder. Is there? I, I actually would like to see the presentation. And you'd like to see the presentation. Yeah. So you probably didn't want to second his motion. Oh, no, I'm happy to second it, but I also would like to see All the presentation. Right. Uh, sorry, Councillor O'Meara, your, your partner has undone you. Mr. Lister, you are welcome at the podium, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Mayor Burton. Good evening, Mayor Burton, Councillors. Thank you for the opportunity to provide our quarterly update on Oakville Hydro to Council this evening. I'm going to step aside, and well, first I'm going to identify who I have with me tonight. I have Jim Collins. Mike Brown, Mary Caputi, Jason Gorell, and Scott Moody. I'm going to ask Mary Caputi, who is our Vice President of Innovation and Growth, to come forward and start the presentation, and that will be followed by Mike Brown, Chief Operating Officer of Oakville Hydro, and will be all be available for any questions, should you have any. So thank you. Mary? Thank you, Mr. Lister. Welcome, Ms. Caputi. We'll clear that off and give you the screen. Good evening, Mayor Burton and town councillors. This summer has proven to be one of the hottest summers that we can remember. Oakville Hydro has set record highs in energy consumption. The recorded data suggests of having at least 21 days over 30 degrees Celsius compared to 11 days in the summer of 2015. This increased energy use by the residents of Oakville and businesses of Oakville did place a stress on our distribution system, which resulted in outages across Oakville. However, our robust system and our automated switching capabilities was able to ensure our customers had power restored for the most part within minutes. In the past month, the residents have now received high electricity bills for their summer usage. Oakville Hydro's customer service personnel have had high volume of calls to address customers' questions and resolve any issues they had. Last month, the Ontario government reacted to the rising cost of electricity, which accounts for over 80% of the electricity bill, and introduced two initiatives. The first, for residents, an 8% rebate, which is in effect January 1st, 2017. And this is an average annual savings of $130 per year. For the larger businesses, a conservation incentive, whereby businesses benefit by making changes to the way they use their electricity. In addition, the province has also mandated that all the local distribution companies ensure that residents have a monthly bill by the end of 2017. And 16. Oakville Hydro has converted its systems and has rolled out the monthly electricity bill beginning mid-August. The monthly bill will ensure that residents better manage their electricity costs and their usage behaviors. It is important to note that Oakville Hydro also bills water consumption on behalf of the region of Halton and those charges will continue to be billed every other month. How we're helping customers in need. At the beginning of 2016, the Ontario Electricity Support Program commenced. Oops, sorry. <laughs> this program is designed to help those in need on a regular basis. So in Oakville, there's over a thousand residents who are enrolled in the program and receive monthly credits on their bills. What is our focus? Service. It is our responsibility to provide a high level of service to our residents and businesses. It is also our responsibility to implement, follow, and communicate the electricity initiatives enacted by the province. Reliability. 
to ensure we have a distribution system that is reliable to each and every resident and business 24 hours a day. And when the outages or interruptions do occur, restore the power as quickly as possible. Lastly, our rates. To ensure we have affordable distribution rates. In Oakville, the residents pay just below $28 per month for Oakville Hydro services. And that accounts for only 18% of the electricity bill. Oakville Hydro's last rate increase was only 1.65%. What are we doing to conserve energy in Oakville? We continue to deliver conservation programs in Oakville. And, oops, sorry, oops, sorry. <laughs> And we have been, uh, this year, there's hundreds of businesses participating in the programs, included the Town of Oakville's LED streetlight conversion program. There have been over 6,000 lights installed to date and anticipated to be at 10,000 by the end of the year. This will provide significant savings and energy costs. In addition, this summer, Oakville Hydro was pleased to provide the Halton Healthcare with Oakville's largest incentive check for over $920,000 for their initiative on energy efficient systems that, put in place, that were put in place in the new Oakville Trafalgar Hospital. Now I'll turn it to my colleague, Mike Brown. Good evening, Mayor Burton and uh, town councillors. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the system operations that we've got in place. Most of you are aware that we do have an industry-leading uh, state-of-the-art uh, control room operations underway. Uh, as a matter of interest, um, we have ongoing delegations both uh, provincially, nationally and internationally that uh, come to tour our facility. It's, uh, uh, we strive to um, continue um, industry leading in regards to outreach management uh, communications as well as um, um, advanced automation to support the development in that space. We have um, a, a backup control room that's uh, in place at our um, Glenorchy uh, transformer station up in the north uh, in case of something happening at the main station. Uh, under innovative partnerships, uh, as a matter of interest, uh, we also service Halton Hills Hydro uh, from our control room operations, one of the few in the province that actually serves a fellow LDC uh, partner. And we look for ways and means to collaborate at that level with some of our, our peers in the industry and in other new developments. Uh, moving forward, um, in regards to tree trimming, as you know, we do this uh, annually and we do it in um, a very tight collaboration with the, uh, the Town of Oakville's uh, forestry staff. Uh, our 2016 program was uh, completed uh, as planned. Um, as I mentioned, with the strong collaboration, we had held an open house uh, at the beginning of uh, 2016 to inform the residents of our plans, and we completed it by May. And we had very few uh, challenges en route, and they were handled, uh, in my view, in a, in a very respectful and responsible way. Um, uh, for 2017, uh, we've got a, a bit of a challenging program. Uh, we're looking at Zone 2. We're looking to advance uh, some of the work into December instead of January. Uh, and again, uh, we'll, we are in, uh, in discussions uh, with uh, town forestry staff on doing so. And we will be conducting an open house uh, uh, to, uh, to help uh, communicate to the residents uh, what our plans are. I want to talk a bit about um, impacts of climate action change um, as it pertains to uh, Oakville. Uh, one of the key targets of the provincial government is um, electric vehicles. They're targeting 5% of new car sales uh, by 2020 to be uh, purely electric vehicle. So that's a pretty significant impact on the, um, the uh, I would say, the distribution infrastructure and obviously um, quite positive impact on uh, greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera. Uh, currently in Oakville, we have uh, over 185 electric vehicles. 
uh, registered uh, in the town. And that's as known by the Ministry of Transportation. Our belief is that there's more, obviously. Um, as a matter of interest, Oakville has the highest density of electric vehicles uh, as a community in Canada. It's over three per thousand uh, residents, so I think that's a, a point of note. Uh, in support of that, um, we are uh, in the midst, and I've mentioned this before at other quarterly updates, uh, we have a smart grid pilot project in Oakville around residential EV managed charging stations that's underway, and I think we're just, just around uh, nine or ten um, residential uh, um, owners uh, have are up and running and this is one just to rem remind uh, the council uh, counselor uh, team here uh, it's in regards to managing the charge rate through the off-peak period which is a responsible way of ensuring that we meet um, the customers obligations but we manage it in a in a prudent uh, system friendly way so um, we're testing that right now and this pilot is being used as one of the ones uh, uh, to support the ministry's goals um, we're also moving forward with two public EV charging stations uh, um, uh, in, in respect to the, uh, the town of Oakville. There'll be one installed here at, uh, at uh, Town Hall, and there'll be another one on, in one of the parking lots downtown. That's the first of a few that uh, we're working on with uh, town staff. And then we've got continued focus on renewable energy, and we're very proud of that. We have five rooftop solar installations, including uh, on uh, Oakville um, Town of Oakville um, assets, including this uh, this particular facility, as well as our headquarters at 861 Redwood. Now, safety is our first priority, and I'm glad. I I love to hear the reference to safety in the discussions earlier tonight. Um, I wanted to uh, acknowledge our team. Uh, we have gone since June of 2012 at Oakville Hydro. Uh, without uh, a lost time injury on staff. That's 992,000 hours continuously. Um, I am here to actually verbally report that we just exceeded 1 million hours as of last week. So we've now hit a rather dramatic threshold. And uh, that in itself is a testimony to the great men and women in our uh, organization who uh, put safety as top, top priority 24-7. A uh, couple of rewards or awards that we actually received, uh, the Dave Ellis Safety Award. Uh, David Ellis, uh, as you may not know, is the son of uh, Rob Ellis, a noted um, Oakville resident. Um, David uh, was unfortunately killed in an industry accident uh, here in Oakville. And uh, Rob has been an absolutely beacon of uh, uh, safety, focused on youth safety uh, in the work environment. Uh, so for us to be the inaugural winner of that industry award is, uh, is, uh, is, a, is very rewarding for us. Um, Infrastructure Health and Safety Association uh, President's Award, we were awarded the 750,000 hour award. Uh, in the community, I just wanted to highlight that um, uh, in May, we, uh, under Oakville Conserves Energy Fair, we partner with the town of Oakville. Uh, we have other events throughout the year, as I've noted here, uh, where um, Oakville Hydro and its staff uh, um, look to actively support by its presence and its availability to be in community events, as recent the Oakville Fair at Glen Ashton Park last weekend. Um, it, that was an inaugural fair, and I, uh, we enjoyed uh, the opportunity to be there as such. So uh, that pretty well wraps up our quarterly report, and uh, I open it up for questions for uh, Rob, myself, or Mary. Thank you, Mike. You've got one right over here from Councillor Adams, and then right over here from Councillor Elder, and then, my goodness, we'll just, we'll, we'll tie you up. Okay, great. Thank you. Councillor Adams. First of all, I'm really glad I asked for the presentation. I thought it was fascinating, your count of EVs in Oakville being 185. One of the first jobs I had when I finished my engineering degree was to count electric vehicles oh, across nice. Canada, and that was in the late 90s, and there weren't 185 electric vehicles in Canada, let alone Oakville at the time. Oh, that's incredible. So that's pretty amazing. Um, I have uh, one question for you, and uh, then one other thing to say, and that is, the first question is about the LED lights. Um, had some questions from residents and we had a discussion at council some time ago, not, not too long ago, about uh, the design of the LED lights. Um, first of all, there's a flashing red light on the top of it. Uh, there's a difference in the light quality and color and the dispersion of the light. Uh, would any of you like to take a stab at explaining to the residents of Oakville uh, the elements of the new light standards that are being used? 
Well, um, since they're actually town assets, I can, to, to my own extent, I can maybe comment on some of that, uh, Councillor Adams. Um, the beacon on the top is actually, it's a, um, it's a, it's a intermittent uh, light. Uh, its intention is to uh, indicate that it's actually sending. So it's actually when it's flashing on a very intermittent basis, uh, my understanding is that's uh, intended to say that it's functioning and operational. Um, uh, when it's not, then it has a different light status. That as much as, as I would know on that. Uh, in regard to um, the, the light intensity, uh, I know a lot of research was done by town staff uh, in regards to that, the heat rating, and I think that one's around a 3,000 uh, rating, which is considered to be nominal lighting for um, uh, roadway outdoors from a pleasing and visibility point of view. That's my, my understanding uh, of that. So. And the last thing is to say thank you on behalf of the Northeast Oakville Fair oh. Committee. Uh, Councillor Lestrina and I and many others got to ride in your bucket truck uh, on Sunday and it was a lot of fun. There were lots of smoke. I think we had, uh, we believe there were about 500 people that came through, um, which was an astounding number for our first time around. So thank you very, very much for, on the, on the last moment, uh, finding a crew to come out and do that with the community. It was great. Well, I, I know our crew would appreciate that comment, and I, I know you probably gave it to them on Sunday as well, but I, they enjoy events like that, to be quite frank. And I, yes, I, I've seen some pictures, so it was great. Yeah, thank you very, very much. You're for welcome. That. Councillor Elgar. Thank you for the presentation. I, I really I do enjoy your presentations because the, the when you start mentioning numbers, and I notice that you're saying 18% of the total electricity bill only 28 like it's only 28 dollars. That's the average for every household. Is that how it's calculated? Yeah. It, when you come again, would it be possible to show us the time of day usage on the average? Like you know you know how you have oh. your different hours of uh, where you're charging different rates if the system is working correctly. Yeah. And it'd be pretty interesting to see whether, and, and to show what it was like maybe a year ago to see, or two years ago, to see how people have shifted to time of day usage. Yeah. Uh, we, could, we could definitely come back with some additional information in that regard. Um, the one thing of note, obviously, uh, we peak uh, as a system and as a community around 5.30, 5.45 in the evening, and that's pretty well typical. So. Um, uh, it would be, yes, we can come back with some maybe additional information to that extent, but I, that's pretty well our system operation. It's like they're levels. coming faster than you thought with the information right yeah. behind you. Oh, good. Mary, <laughs> by all means, go ahead. So um, the three um, time periods would be the on-peak, off-peak, and uh, mid-peak. So most, the averages most residents use is about 68% is off-peak, which is 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., and the other two is, is the remaining, you know, 15% each. So 68% are using their consumption off peak, which is, which is a really good, because that's when the prices are the lowest. So that's right. the average. Now, uh, okay, and now that you're up there, I was, I've noticed you mentioned you've only increased your rates 1.8%. Now, does your, does your rate work on kilowatts, or is it, uh, how does it work? <laughs> So um, our rates are approved by the Ontario Energy Board, so we just can't increase rates, so they go through a process. Right. Um, and our rates are partially fixed and partially volumetric, which is based on kilowatt hours, the usage part. So how would I explain that to a, to a resident of Oakville? Well, it's part this and part that. Is there... Well, actually, that problem will be resolved because um, by the end of next year, we'll have one fixed rate. And it will not be on any usage component. It will zero be usage, and it's still usage. Yeah. It's going to move. Yeah, and the whole province will be moving. Every LDC will be moving to one fixed rate. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any idea what that one fixed rate will be at this point? <laughs> this is just for sure. ours, so that it it is it'll be similar to. Uh, it wouldn't be any more than thirty thirty one. So in, in total, how many kilowatts does the average household use a day? What, 750 per month. 750 kilowatts a month? Per month. Per month, eh? And 68% is in off-peak hours. On off-peak hours. I thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. I appreciate the report. I think we're now to Councillor Liz Chinna. 
I also want to echo the uh, sentiments that Councillor Adams had put forth that uh, con considering it was very last minute for us to ask for volunteers, uh, we were so pleased that gotcha. they were able to come out. And that was one of the rides that was a, a lineup all day long. So we do appreciate okay. that. Great. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, my question is, you had indicated that 6,000 LED lights have been installed in the last year, or, or is it in the last quarter or the last? I think it's in the last two quarters. Am I correct? It's it's been over the last four to six what, months. What percentage is that of what uh, is still to be installed? I, I may be, uh, yeah, I was just going to say it's either between nine and 10,000 total in, so that would be correct. So how, so how many, what's the percentage? It'd be about 60% in, because there's 6,000 on about, not, just over, I think, 9,000 lights, if I'm not mistaken. And are you able to provide any, um, information about the savings to the town with respect to that conversion? Yeah. I, um, I would it suggest, might, yes, I, I would suggest that would be a, a really good conversation with the town and we can come back and talk to that once all the system is up in operation. I, I think they're going through some testing and, and uh, okay. calibration and things of that and, at this nature, but it, it would be a good question to pose for sure. I will do that later. Uh, so my last question is uh, the smart grid pilot that sure. you had mentioned in your report. Um, is that funded by the province or is that uh, take, uh, by Oakville Hydro? Because yeah. it sounds like the province is looking uh, to the, get some um, information out of that. Yeah, it's, um, it's an in-kind funding for us. We put time and resources uh, into it. We also are um, um, leasing out the, um, uh, the EV chart, the managed charger. So we're working with the, uh, um, the technical development company as well as um, the back office management company. So since we're leasing it, it's, it's an Oakville Hydro uh, asset that we're putting in uh, on a measured pilot basis. So that's our cost in plus the time and effort to uh, put it up and, and operational. There is some additional financing on the development end. I know that uh, uh, the province is providing through their smart grid fund to kind of get this all, of, all the whole process put in place. I think we're over to Councillor Giddings now. Thank you so much. Uh, you mentioned adding a charging station downtown Oakville. Yeah. Any idea at this point when we rebuild downtown how many we would be adding? Because if there was a time to do it cost effectively and whether it be one per block or a green corral or whatever the best practices are, any sense at this point? Um, we're open to just about anything. We've had ongoing discussions with town staff on this. The two is just to kind of get into the game and, and look for those opportunities. Um, I, I would agree with you. I think there's more opportunities downtown. Part of it is the parking situation and how do you actually position an EV charging station uh, to provide the most benefit. Uh, usually it's the municipal parking areas where you get best access and we have very few that we, I can probably think of two or three specific sites that would be best in the core but we, we'll, uh, we'll definitely work to put, uh, put more and we have more in plan for consideration right now but the two was just just to get it underway make sure we've got a good footprint to start and, and more would be considered for sure. All right and further to Councillor Elder's question uh, the comment was 68 percent of the usage by Oakvillians is off peak. Right. Was, uh, did I miss it? Do we know what that's grown from? Do we, can we go back that far to see what difference the, the peak strategy has made? Yeah. Um, I, I'm suggesting we probably don't have that for this meeting. Uh, we right. probably do have that information that we could actually bring back. I'm just curious uh, in terms no, of have we shifted yeah. the needle. And yeah, to see whether the um, time of use has created a, an actual move on the needle in regards to usage. Yeah, that would be All something right. we could and bring back. I echo the Ward 6 candidates in terms of the lift truck. Uh, that is on my bucket list as well. Thanks. Oh, no pun intended. Thank you very much. Councillor Noel. Thank you. I guess we're all big fans of the bucket truck, so I'm going to join the chorus and thank you as well for uh, supporting Oak Park Fall great. Fair for the, uh, oh, I don't know, great. tenth year in a row or whatever with the bucket truck. I, I didn't actually get a chance to go on it because the line was so long I didn't want to stand in front of eight-year-olds. So. Um, <laughs> Actually, I was afraid. Anyway, um, thank you so much for that. My question is with respect to uh, electric vehicles. So um, full disclosure, I'm a member of the pilot program. Um, just to put that out front. Um, and I love it. It's great. Thank you so much. The one thing that I noted in my experience with that pilot is that um, houses, in particularly in the newer subdivisions, aren't necessarily wired 
to um, accommodate this new emerging technology. Um, for example, when my when we, you were coming to install, not you personally, uh, coming to install the charger, I didn't have sufficient amperage in my house. As most homes in North Oakville have like a 100 amp service, and unless I wanted to forgo my air conditioner or my stove, um, I had a problem, so I had to dial it back. Is this something that is uh, being noted by um, the folks that, that, I guess, set standards? Um, and whether it's, I don't think it's OBC, but it's probably the, um, whatever legislation it is that, that dictates minimum standards for, for wiring of homes. Is that something that, that is uh, contemplated for uh, future uh, legislative or regulatory change to make sure that homes are, are, are built with yeah. sufficient capacity to accommodate this technology? Um, Councillor Noel, that's a, a very, very astute question. It's exactly what uh, needs to be done. Uh, we sit on a working group at the ministry level in regards to this uh, with the whole evolution of EV because they really want to get it right uh, as they roll it out across the province. Um, one thing for sure, similar to what they've done in uh, British Columbia, uh, specifically in Vancouver, is they've modified the building codes to reflect the fact that all new residential buildings have to be uh, properly wired, properly uh, serviced uh, to allow EVs. And that even goes as far as uh, condo units, all new condo units. Uh, and, and this is uh, being planned in Ontario as well, in collaboration between the Minister of Energy and uh, 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 I forget the infrastructure uh, ministry as such. Uh, condos, uh, the plan is to look for separate infrastructure for condos so that you could actually provide uh, EV charging and it's not actually part of the common infrastructure so that EV users would be, would be, um, uh, be able to be, uh, you know, they would be paying through their own uh, uh, cost of use type thing. But that is definitely uh, front and center for the ministries to say, building code has to change to make sure that we're not obligating uh, uh, you know, major change outs going forward on, on new homes. Good point. Back to Councillor Chinna. Thank you very much. Um, so the earlier discussion by, uh, or comment by Councillor Giddings uh, about off-peak hours uh, brought something that I recall from, I guess, the news or the newspapers about um, the province indicating that uh, the, that people are being too efficient and so they're not getting enough revenue from the off-peak hours. Um, is there anything that, uh, any uh, discussions that you've heard of uh, with respect to uh, eliminating the, the delta or the change between those hours, the 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Mm. versus daytime in order to uh, increase the revenue sources from, from hydro? Not that they're not increased already. I don't believe, the government itself doesn't get any revenue from the electricity uh, usage. And if anything, over time, they would increase the delta between the low rate and the high rate. Right now, due to the controversy over high electricity rates, the government may not do anything or they'll, they'll just keep status quo for a while. Uh, um, but, uh, and there's actually supposed to be a rate increase coming out no, for November 1st and was supposed to be actually announced today. Typically, we hear about those because uh, every six months there's an increase in the time of use rates. We haven't heard, so maybe that's not going to happen this time due to the, um, the concern about raising rising electricity rates. But if anything, the delta would increase over time to promote more off-peak usage. I'll just add yeah. one little anecdote, if I could. Um, EV charging, the one very clear message that the ministry has uh, they're looking at free overnight charging for EVs in the province of Ontario. So that's part of the working group's mandate. I, Councillor Noel, I thought you'd be thrilled with that, and the mayor as well. Um, so that, that's, again, to encourage off-peak usage. So that's, a, that's an area that they're zeroing in on, and that's, they're looking to implement that in the beginning of 2017. So they've got a pretty aggressive uh, track plan on this one. So. Then can you also comment on the capacity of the system if we do get such an increase in, in uh, EV use? Yeah, um, I, I can talk to our distribution system. I, I, I believe that we're in pretty good shape. Uh, if you have pockets of um, electric vehicles in a neighborhood, if they're all condensed around one transformer, and a, a transformer normally serves about eight residents. That's just use that as a typical. 
one EV level two charger would be the equivalent of one home charge. So that's adding another home to the, um, uh, the, the service load on a transformer. So that's the significance of it. So if you have, a, if you have two or three, um, then we could get into a situation. But our view on this one is we'd rather get out in front of it. And that's why the managed charger pilot is we'd, we'd rather be part of working with the, the, uh, the customers, our residents around, ensuring that we can meet their needs at the same time manage our system. So we believe that that's, and I think the ministry feels that way as well. So we won't get everybody there, but I, I believe that we have good monitoring in our system. Um, we will continue to monitor it from a load point of view, and we'll be looking for those hot spots as they identify, because knowing where these EVs in the system, that's the key, to be quite frank, is knowing where the, and we, we gain information from the MTO on where those locations are, and we use that as a basis for understanding the impact in our system. Thank you. Thank you very much to everyone from Oakville Hydro and Thank Oakville you. Enterprises for the uh, enlightening reports. And the motion to receive is on the floor now from uh, Councillor O'Meara. Thank you for that. And Councillor Adams. All those in favor? Opposed, if any. And the, the consent items are uh, received and approved. Uh, Council, I now call your attention to the confidential consent item. Is there a mover and seconder for this item? Uh, Councillor Grant and Councillor Knoll, all in favor? Opposed, if any. Thank you. Um, Council, congratulations. We've just appointed a deputy fire chief, and it can now be revealed that congratulations are in order to Paul Boissonneau. And uh, Chief, uh, I hope he's happy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Council, you now have, uh, uh, you already dealt with discussion item number three, and that brings us to item number four, the supplementary report, the Province of Ontario Coordinated Land Use Planning Review. If you'll give your attention to Mr. Bigger, he'll update us on the matter we referred to this meeting. Councillor Elgar. Your Worship, um, we, we have dealt with this before and we made a few changes, so I don't need a, 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 rep um, a presentation unless other members of council do, but I do have a question of, uh, of the Mr. Bigger on this, just understand. Uh, um, Councillor, I, I would like, for the benefit of the public, the presentation. Uh, would you like to ask a question first? Uh, well, I can do that. Uh, it doesn't matter. Go ahead with the presentation. Maybe it'll answer my question. That's fine. He's given you a chance. are again a couple weeks since our last meeting to discuss the province of Ontario co coordinated land use planning review and the item four on your agenda is a supplementary report to that first report that we discussed two weeks ago at Planning and Development Council on October 3rd. Uh, just to, to reorient to the, the subject, uh, the coordinated land use planning review has been underway since 2015 and uh, it's looking at four provincial plans including the two that apply to Oakville the Greenbelt Plan and the Growth Plan. And we have uh, participated fully in this process as staff and as council and as community. Uh, and we're approaching the deadline for comments to the province on the proposed changes to these plans. And that deadline is at the end of this month, October 31st. Uh, again, uh, this is where the pictures dry up in my presentation. It's pretty text heavy from here on. Uh, but it won't take very long to get through. Uh, the two plans that do apply to Oakville are, the, as I mentioned, the Growth Plan and the Greenbelt Plan. We're back here tonight again. Uh, when we discussed on October 3rd, we reviewed how the vision of the plans has been reinforced through this planning framework to curb sprawl, uh, to direct and manage growth. Uh, that's been confirmed and refined through these, these proposed changes to the plans. Uh, these changes have introduced some new concepts. We've seen how the upper and single tier responsibilities have been enhanced through these proposed changes. Some of the changes are subtle yet significant. We, we went through some of those together. Uh, there remain some long-standing matters unresolved. And uh, again, we have some concerns identified around uncertainty and the, the proposed implementation measures. So at that meeting on October 3rd, uh, Council deferred the item back for staff to provide additional information. And that's what this supplemental report is before you. We have brought back 
the original report, because we haven't dealt with those recommendations. We brought that back in the appendix to the report in its entirety, and we've revised the recommendation on tonight's report, as well as provided this new, uh, new information. There are essentially four items that we discussed that Council uh, wanted to have more, uh, more commentary added to the town submission to the province. And so one of the key ones which links to funding, which is a major concern about how to fund growth, uh, we wanted to, to be very clear with the province that growth must pay for itself and that uh, when we talk about new tools, we want, it, want the message to be very clear that those no, new tools are not local taxes. We want to see uh, proper funding for growth coming from the province and we also are recommending that as a sustainable approach, uh, uh, amendments to the Development Charges Act to provide for the full recovery of, of growth relate, related costs would be uh, something that that uh, Town of Oakville would recommend to the province. Second major comment that we had was around the Greenbelt Plan and you may recall that this is a made in Oakville good news story as far as uh, the evolution of that plan and, and the Urban River Valley designation. We felt that the, the province needed to understand a little bit more uh, Town of Oakville's position around how to implement a system, uh, a system based approach to protecting natural heritage and that the provincial policy to do so would be uh, more uh, suitably met through the designation if, if it was applied independent of land ownership so that the de designation would apply equally to public lands and private lands. And so uh, that is our, our second main point in the supplementary comments to the province about the Urban River Valley designation that should apply to private lands as well. Uh, this again is a continuation of our discussion around uh, the types of decisions that Council makes and, and, and related to the implementation of an official plan. And one of the big components of our official plan is an urban structure. And uh, in the report from October 3rd, we were recommending the province that any um, private applications to change the, fundamentally change or affect the town's urban structure should not be permitted. Uh, and that um, Further, uh, Town of Oakville Council and the Town of Oakville wanted to recommend that any implementation of an urban structure through council decisions would be sheltered from appeal so that once those decisions were made, then everyone had to live with those decisions and uh, wouldn't have a, an appeal process to try and change council's decision. So that was a very important continuation of that discussion and that point about protecting the urban structure. And then finally, uh, uh, this is under the subtle but significant changes category and it's how the responsibility for planning decisions has been shifting up um, away from the local municipalities and into the upper and single tier uh, realm and so the recommendation to to the province is that um, that the, the those changes proposed in the growth plan uh, should not shift responsibility away from lower tiers and the message that we want to deliver is that the best uh, opportunity for the implementation of de growth and development and uh, the development of complete communities is with the local authority and so they cannot be um, left out or excluded from that decision-making process and so the requirement to undertake local planning and to reflect uh, important community attributes and neighborhood qualities must be required by the growth plan not uh, reduced reduced by the growth plan excuse me so those are the four, four key comments that we took away from our October 3rd meeting. Uh, in, in quick summary, um, the recommendation in the report before you is a long one, but essentially what we're saying in the first bullet is to receive the two reports, one to today's supplementary report and, and uh, the October 3rd appendix uh, original report. And so council were asking to receive that and then we're asking council to endorse this package as our submission to the province. And then thirdly, uh, and that would be to, to be submitted by the October 31st deadline. And then thirdly, the recommendation is to circulate this package to all our, our partners and our, our colleagues and other agencies. And that's the, uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Councillor Elger, did you still have a question? Yes, I do. And it's uh, back on uh, number three, sheltering local municipal council decisions. Okay, Kirk? Mm -hmm. now, Kirk, when I look at that reading, uh, 
Restrictions to be placed on the initiation of private official plan amendments for large scale proposals outside of designated urban structure. Right now, if you go to the regional official plan, it's urban area, which pretty well Oak Oakville is urban area, the most part. But it includes, in urban area includes parks, golf courses, all the lands, basically, in Oakville. So I was, my concern was that we shouldn't just say you, it's outside of the designated greenfield and built boundary area. We want, once we, council makes a decision on large scale projects, they can't be, uh, they can't be appealed. That, that, that's, that was what I meant a, a week or two ago, but when I read this, it doesn't, like, maybe I'm reading it wrong, but I don't see it says that. So you, the, uh, the second bullet on the slide is intended to shelter the council decision around implementing the urban structure. Does that not take the, the, well, the I'm first I'm concerned, are forward? we in the urban area, if we're in the urban area mm -hmm. on the regional plan, mm -hmm. and we happen to have some private open space, you can have a parking lot, it doesn't matter. But if it's in this area, does that mean that uh, we will have to accept applications? Like that's, this It's a very fundamental, uh, important thing for me anyway, that we're very clear going forward what, we, what is intended. So the, the, the suggestion, the recommendation, the first bullet is to say for large scale private applications that are not conforming to the urban structure, not following the urban structure, those would not be permitted. And then, and I hear you. Okay, yeah. what does that what does that mean? What is urban so then, structure? What do you say? In for you, urban structure means what? Well, the I think does it mean private open space specifically? It is. A, I think o large open space areas, private open space included, are part of the. It's urban structure. I think every element in the the town uh, forms a part of the structure. But yeah. So we have a we have a structure for managing. Growth and development, our growth areas, our stable, pr protected residential, uh, the transportation system, all of those add up to form a structure. But, no, but you're only taking out saying they can't do it for greenfield area and built boundary area. Like you're, what you're really saying is you can't do anything, they can't appeal in a green belt area or anything outside of the urban area is what I read this. Am I reading it incorrectly? I hope I am. I'm not sure. I need your help here. <laughs> uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, the intent of this recommendation is to ensure that um, if there's a change to the urban structure, so a designated urban structure within the plan, that could be a private open space changing to something else. It could be a major retail changing to uh, residential. It could be any of those major swings in the way in which you've defined your urban structure. It cannot be taken place through a private amendment. It can only be undertaken through a municipal comprehensive review. So an applicant can't come in and apply for something. Um, and if council does not agree with that, they couldn't appeal it. This is almost the same way in which we approach um, employment lands, for example. You can't come in and convert employment lands where you can make an application. If council doesn't agree, you can't appeal it to the board. The second recommendation that's there um, takes it a step further, and this is, I think, the suggestion that you had made at Planning and Development Council, which was that uh, amendments that result from that municipal comprehensive review, review should not be subject to an appeal. So, in essence, those two combined things say that when you're changing our major urban structure, we've done a municipal comprehensive review, it's not subject to an entire municipal board process. Why did we say uh, urban structure bracket designated greenfield area and built boundary area? Why, why did we highlight that, only that portion? Because uh, knowing how people think, and I, I like, they look for the, the particular word to say, well, you didn't say that. Like what you just said, Jane, uh, absolutely, that's, that's what I want. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm worried about when we bracket those, those words, because I, I, you can see where, Maybe someone else may take it literally somewhere different than where we intend to go. So but can we add in here so it's very clear? Is it possible, Jane? I could, I could uh, attempt to clarify through you, Mr. Chair. 
I think the, the, the first bullet is a little brief as far as providing a full explanation of what's intended with that statement. In the appendix A, so the original report, I've, I've turned that up now, and it, um, it's page 91 of the agenda. And that section, two, I can let you go there, um, it provides a little more explanation. What the current growth plan requires is a municipal comprehensive review to amend your urban boundary or to, uh, ex so it's to expand um, the built boundary area or a designated greenfield area. And okay, okay, Kurt, this so, is exactly it. Right. That's right. So, so and yeah. that's what that's not enough. We like I, we have to go further. That's that, correct. That, that's yeah. And so then, that what this comment is saying is that the power, the requirement to do a municipal comprehensive review, also needs to be expanded to include changes to the urban structure. And so, any private applications and flowing from there through the explanation. So, so what we're, we feel currently the growth plan doesn't protect the local authority's urban structure, and we're Bingo. asking that it be expanded to protect in two ways. One, by requiring an MCR to change an urban structure and not a private application. And then secondly, decisions to implement that municipal comprehensive review to develop the structure would be sheltered from appeal. So when I read the quotations, I, I, I don't read it that way. Like it, it, it doesn't... Maybe everybody else reads it that it protects everything, but I sh certainly don't get that feeling when I read it. I get the feeling it's just a designated greenfield area and built boundary area that's excluded from allowing for uh, the developers, basically, to say, hey, we, we wanna, we're going to build houses here. It, it's in the urban area. So are you saying that, uh, are, you, are you back to the point on the slide? Or yeah, in the no, text yeah, back of the report? to the point on the slide and yeah. in the secondary report also, yeah. Kirk. Okay. Number mm -hmm. three on page 85. I wonder if we can just beef it up a little bit. I think you know what we want. I, I just don't think it comes, comes across. If we don't ask for it, we'll, if you don't ask, you'll never get. That's right. my concern. Well, and so maybe we won't get it, but. <laughs> it no, I th well, I think we are, we are asking it in, in two parts of the report. So what, what on page 85, what the third bullet is intending to do, or the third, the third point, Point number three is to refer back to the original comment on page 91. And so that original comment says that changes to the urban structure should only be done through a municipal comprehensive review as is currently required for these other types of changes. And so that's what, what's bracketed. So we're saying that same protection, the same requirement needs to be extended to the urban structure as well as expanding the urban boundary, for example. That's what you're saying in this? That's what we say on page 91. So we say that the municipality's urban structure should be protected by a municipal comprehensive review and that private applications to change that urban structure should be restricted. Which would look so after that, dealing with private open space, they cannot do that. Or other types of... Or, or, or yes. yes. Got it. So, so that's, what, that's what the first point on page 91 says. And then we discussed that point and you raised uh, the idea of sheltering decisions to implement that uh, urban structure. And so once this council makes a decision around the urban structure, that's not subject to appeal. It's done. And that's what the okay. bullet three on page 85 is intending to communicate. So this slide sort of mashes it all it up. Kind of rolls one, together. Yeah. By itself, it doesn't it's do the what two it steps. wants. So. Okay, I thank you for that. I will move Bottom the line, we're not submitting the slide, we're submitting the recommendations. Yeah, the report has, I think, the right content. And um, just in case there's something new, let's hold the phone here. The, the director has come up. Councillor Giddings, you can be next. Mr. Bigger. Sorry, pardon me? I, I, missed, I missed the question. We're waiting to see if you have anything fresh or if we're going to Councillor Giddings. Oh, uh, that's all I had to say to count Councillor Elgar's point. Thank you. Thank so you. I think I'm clear on that. Councillor Giddings. Yeah, thank you very much. In terms of the first point, improvements to development charges legislation, I guess this is more of a request for uh, Budget Chair Adams in terms of at the region, we know there's a shortfall of about $10 million a year. 
as a result of the changes to the DC Act uh, nearly 20 years ago. I think it may be of interest for our residents and the committee members in terms of what that effect has on the town budget, seeing as we're going through the 2017 process. I happen to know that number. It's about $7 million a year for us. And of course, we pay for our share of the region's 10. Which is about another 40%, taxpayer. so yeah, pretty darn close. So, you know, you're 11, $12 million a year, the Oakville taxpayer, to subsidize developers. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Did you have a report on that? That'd be good to have. Uh, we can probably get you one. Uh, so let, me, let me see. Is uh, Councillor Elgar moving this? I will move it to get this rolling. We've got another important one coming up in November on the OMB reform too, so it, it, it's going to be interesting. Who would like to second it? Councillor O'Meara would like to second it. All in favor? Opposed to Finney, and that's carried. Uh, Council, that brings us to uh, new business, and I'm not aware of any, and I'm also not aware of any regional reports or questions about town boards, but I am aware of two requests for reports. Your, your Worship. Councillor Adams, what do Sorry, you Sorry, I have, under new business, I have a, a very quick congratulatory note to say uh, to the organizers of the Northeast Oakville Fair uh, that we held on Sunday. I mentioned it earlier, but I want to uh, formally congratulate uh, the, the committee that um, put it all together, uh, including Councillor Lestrina and myself. And uh, there are a couple of, there are two residents in particular, Maureen Taylor Organi and Rashad Nazir, who were instrumental in making the whole thing come together. Uh, PhysioMed was our gold sponsor, so we wanted to thank them. And I wanted to thank our staff who uh, helped out providing guidance putting tables together, getting a fire truck out, getting the Oakville Hydro truck out. There are a whole bunch of bits and pieces that um, came together in, uh, and it was a whole group of people that were involved in making their little bits happen. So I just wanted to thank our staff for the help that they provided as well. Uh, we had something like 500 people out there. We, we were crossing our fingers for the weather and the weather really held out for us. So it was a really nice day. Thank I take you it you're a, you're a believer in community fairs now. It was a lot of fun. Good answer. Um, so, Council, if there's no other, um, it's uh, moved by Councillor Chinna, seconded by Councillor Knoll, that staff report back on the new fees and permits schedule with respect to union gas being required to apply for permits for maintenance work. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed, if any? Approved. Moved by Councillor O'Meara, seconded by Councillor Lischina. Did staff report back to council on licensing for Airbnb in Oakville? All those in favor? Opposed, if any? Approved. Um, council, uh, it's now time to deal with the consideration and reading of the bylaws. Is there a mover and seconder for the bylaws? Councillor Knoll, Councillor Giddings, all in favor? Opposed, if any? Thank you very much. The bylaws are carried. Uh, that concludes our uh, agenda. Thank you very much for your time and attention. It's been great working with you, and we're adjourned.